This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter Number 14 Section 1 Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings Morphology, Embryology, Rudimentary Organs Contents of this chapter include Classification, Groups Subordinate to Groups, Natural System, Rules and Difficulties in Classification, explained on the theory of descent with modification, classification of varieties, descent always used in classification, analogical or adaptive characters, affinities, general, complex, and radiating, extinction separates and defines groups, morphology between members of the same class, between parts of the same individual, embryology, laws of, explained by variations not supervening at an early age, and being inherited at a corresponding age. Rudimentary organs, their origin explained. Summary Classification From the most remote period in the history of the world, organic beings have been found to resemble each other in descending degrees, so that they can be classed in groups under groups. This classification is not arbitrary, like the grouping of the stars in constellations. The existence of groups would have been of simple significance, if one group had been exclusively fitted to inhabit the land, and another the water, one to feed on flesh, another on vegetable matter, and so on. But the case is widely different, for it is notorious how commonly members of even the same subgroup have different habits. In the second and fourth chapters, on variation and on natural selection, I have attempted to show that within each country it is the widely ranging, the much diffused and common, that is the dominant species, belonging to the larger genera in each class, which vary most. The varieties, or incipient species, thus produced, ultimately become converted into new and distinct species, and these, on the principle of inheritance, tend to produce other new and dominant species. Consequently, the groups which are now large, and which generally include many dominant species, tend to go on increasing in size. I further attempted to show that from the varying descendants of each species trying to occupy as many and as different places as possible in the economy of nature, they constantly tend to diverge in character. This latter conclusion is supported by observing the great diversity of forms which in any small area come into the closest competition, and by certain facts in naturalization. I attempted also to show that there is a steady tendency in the forms which are increasing in number and diverging in character to supplant and exterminate the preceding less divergent and less improved forms. I request the reader to turn to the diagram illustrating the action, as formally explained, of these several principles, and he will see that the inevitable result is that the modified descendants proceeding from one progenitor become broken up into groups subordinate to groups. In the diagram, each letter on the uppermost line may represent a genus including several species, and the whole of the genera along this upper line form together one class, for all are descended from one ancient parent, and consequently have inherited something in common. But the three genera on the left hand have, on this same principle, much in common, and form a subfamily distinct from that containing the next two genera on the right hand which diverged from a common parent at the fifth stage of descent. These five genera have also much in common, though less than when grouped in subfamilies, 
and they form a family distinct from that containing the three genera still further to the right hand, which diverged at an earlier period. And all these genera, descended from A, form an order distinct from the genera descended from I, so that we here have many species descended from a single progenitor grouped into genera, and the genera into subfamilies, families, and orders, all under one great class. The grand fact of the natural subordination of organic beings in groups under groups, which from its familiarity does not always sufficiently strike us, is in my judgment thus explained. No doubt organic beings, like all other objects, can be classed in many ways, either artificially by single characters, or more naturally by a number of characters. We know, for instance, that minerals and the elemental substances can thus be arranged. In this case there is, of course, no relation to genealogical succession, and no cause can at present be assigned for their falling into groups. But with organic beings the case is different, and the view above given accords with their natural arrangement in group under group, and no other explanation has ever been attempted. Naturalists, as we have seen, try to arrange the species, genera, and families in each class on what is called the natural system. But what is meant by this system? Some authors look at it merely as a scheme for arranging together those living objects which are most alike, and for separating those which are most unlike, or as an artificial method of enunciating, as briefly as possible, general propositions. That is, by one sentence, to give the characters common, for instance, to all mammals, by another, those common to all carnivora, by another, those common to the dog genus, and then, by adding a single sentence, a full description is given of each kind of dog. The ingenuity and utility of this system are indisputable, but many naturalists think that something more is meant by the natural system. They believe that it reveals the plan of the Creator, but unless it be specified whether order in time or space, or both, or what else is meant by the plan of the Creator, it seems to me that nothing is thus added to our knowledge. Expressions such as that famous one by Linnaeus, which we often meet with in a more or less concealed form, namely, that the characters do not make the genus, but that the genus gives the characters, seem to imply that some deeper bond is included in our classifications than mere resemblance. I believe that this is the case and that community of descent, the one known cause of close similarity in organic beings, is the bond which, though observed by various degrees of modification, is partly revealed to us by our classifications. Let us now consider the rules followed in classification, and the difficulties which are encountered on the view that classification either gives some unknown plan of creation, or is simply a scheme for enunciating general propositions, and of placing together the forms most like each other. It might have been thought, and was in ancient times thought, that those parts of the structure which determined the habits of life, and the general place of each being in the economy of nature, would be of very high importance in classification. Nothing can be more false. No one regards the external similarity of a mouse to a shrew, of a dugong to a whale, of a whale to a fish, as of any importance. These resemblances, though so intimately connected with the whole life of the being, are ranked as merely adaptive or analogical characters, but to the consideration of these resemblances we shall recur. It may even be given as a general rule that the less any part of the organization is concerned with special habits, the more important it becomes for classification. As an instance, Owen, in speaking of the dugong, says, The generative organs, being those which are most remotely related to the habits and food of an animal, I have always regarded as affording very clear indications of its true affinities, 
we are least likely in the modifications of these organs to mistake a merely adaptive for an essential character. With plants, how remarkable it is that the organs of vegetation, on which their nutrition and life depend, are of little signification, whereas the organs of reproduction, with their product, the seed and the embryo, are of paramount importance. So again, informally discussing certain morphological characters which are not functionally important, we have seen that they are often of the highest service in classification. This depends on their constancy throughout many allied groups, and their constancy chiefly depends on any slight deviations not having been preserved and accumulated by natural selection, which acts only on serviceable characters. That the mere physiological importance of an organ does not determine its classificatory value is almost proved by the fact that in allied groups, in which the same organ, as we have every reason to suppose, has nearly the same physiological value, its classificatory value is widely different. No naturalist can have worked at any group without being struck with this fact, and it has been fully acknowledged in the writings of almost every author. It will suffice to quote the highest authority, Robert Brown, who, in speaking of certain organs in the Proteaceae, says their generic importance, like that of all their parts, not only in this, but as I apprehend in every natural family, is very unequal, and in some cases seems to be entirely lost. Again, in another work, he says, the genera of the Conoraceae differ in having one or more ovaria in the existence or absence of albumen, in the imbricate or valvular estivation, any one of these characters singly is frequently of more than generic importance, though here even, when taken all together, they appear insufficient to separate Nestis from Canaras. To give an example among insects, in one great division of the Hymenoptera, the antennae, as Westwood has remarked, are most constant in structure. In another division they differ much, and the differences are of quite subordinate value in classification. Yet no one will say that the antennae in these two divisions of the same order are of unequal physiological importance. Any number of instances could be given of the varying importance for classification of the same important organ within the same group of beings. Again, no one will say that rudimentary or atrophied organs are of high physiological or vital importance, yet undoubtedly organs in this condition are often of much value in classification. No one will dispute that the rudimentary teeth in the upper jaws of young ruminants and certain rudimentary bones of the leg are highly serviceable in exhibiting the close affinity between ruminants and pachyderms. Robert Brown has strongly insisted on the fact that the position of the rudimentary florets is of the highest importance in the classification of the grasses. Numerous instances could be given of characters derived from parts which must be considered of very trifling physiological importance, but which are universally admitted as highly serviceable in the definition of whole groups. For instance, whether or not there is an open passage from the nostrils to the mouth, the only character, according to Owen, which absolutely distinguishes fishes and reptiles, the inflection of the angle of the lower jaw in marsupials, the manner in which the wings of insects are folded, mere colour in certain algae, mere pubescence on parts of the flower in grasses, the nature of the dermal covering, as hair or feathers, in the vertebrata. If the ornithorhynchus had been covered with feathers instead of hair, this external and trifling character would have been considered by naturalists as an important aid in determining the degree of affinity of this strange creature to birds. The importance for classification of trifling characters 
mainly depends on their being correlated with many other characters of more or less importance. The value, indeed, of an aggregate of characters is very evident in natural history. Hence, as has often been remarked, a species may depart from its allies in several characters, both of high physiological importance and of almost universal prevalence, and yet leave us in no doubt where it should be ranked. Hence, also, it has been found that a classification founded on any single character, however important that may be, has always failed, for no part of the organization is invariably constant. The importance of an aggregate of characters, even when none are important, alone explains the aphorism enunciated by Linnaeus, namely, that the characters do not give the genus, but the genus gives the character, for this seems founded on the appreciation of many trifling points of resemblance, too slight to be defined. Certain plants belonging to the Malpighiaceae bear perfect and degraded flowers. In the latter, as A. de Jussieu has remarked, the greater number of the characters proper to the species, to the genus, to the family, to the class, disappear, and thus laugh at our classification. When Aspicarpa produced in France during several years only those degraded flowers, departing so wonderfully in a number of the most important points of structure from the proper type of the order, yet M. Richard sagaciously saw, as Jussieu observes, that this genus should still be retained among the Malpighiaceae. This case well illustrates the spirit of our classifications. Practically, when naturalists are at work, they do not trouble themselves about the physiological value of the characters which they use in defining a group, or in allocating any particular species. If they find a character nearly uniform, and common to a great number of forms and not common to others, they use it as one of high value. If common to some lesser number, they use it as of subordinate value. This principle has been broadly confessed by some naturalists to be the true one, and by none more clearly than by that excellent botanist Auguste Saint-Hilaire. If several trifling characters are always found in combination, though no apparent bond of connection can be discovered between them, a special value is set on them. As in most groups of animals, important organs, such as those for propelling the blood, or for aerating it, or those for propagating the race, are found nearly uniform. They are considered as highly serviceable in classification. But in some groups all these, the most important vital organs, are found to offer characters of quite subordinate value. Thus, as Fritz Müller has lately remarked, in the same group of crustaceans, Cypridina is furnished with a heart, while in two closely allied genera, namely Cypris and Cytherea, there is no such organ. One species of Cypridina has well-developed branchiae, while another species is destitute of them. We can see why characters derived from the embryo should be of equal importance with those derived from the adult, for a natural classification of course includes all ages, but it is by no means obvious on the ordinary view why the structure of the embryo should be more important for this purpose than that of the adult, which alone plays its full part in the economy of nature. Yet it has been strongly urged by those great naturalists Milne Edwards and Agassiz that embryological characters are the most important of all, and this doctrine has very generally been admitted as true. Nevertheless, their importance has sometimes been exaggerated owing to the adaptive characters of larvae not having been excluded. In order to show this, Fritz Müller arranged, by the aid of such characters alone, the great class of crustaceans, and the arrangement did not prove a natural one. But there can be no doubt that embryonic, excluding larval characters, are of the highest value for classification, not only with animals, but with plants. Thus the main divisions of flowering plants are founded on differences in the embryo. 
on the number and position of the cotyledons, and on the mode of development of the plumule and radical. We shall immediately see why these characters possess so high a value in classification, namely, from the natural system being genealogical in its arrangement. Our classifications are often plainly influenced by chains of affinities. Nothing can be easier than to define a number of characters common to all birds, but with crustaceans any such definition has hitherto been found impossible. There are crustaceans at the opposite ends of the series, which have hardly a character in common, yet the species at both ends, from being plainly allied to others, and these to others, and so onwards, can be recognized as unequivocally belonging to this and to no other class of the articulata. Geographical distribution has often been used, though perhaps not quite logically, in classification, more especially in very large groups of closely allied forms. Temink insists on the utility or even necessity of this practice in certain groups of birds, and it has been followed by several entomologists and botanists. Finally, with respect to the comparative value of the various groups of species, such as orders, suborders, families, subfamilies, and genera, they seem to be, at least at present, almost arbitrary. Several of the best botanists, such as Mr. Bentham and others, have strongly insisted on their arbitrary value. Instances could be given among plants and insects of a group first ranked by practised naturalists as only a genus, and then raised to the rank of a subfamily or family. And this has been done not because further research has detected important structural differences at first overlooked, but because numerous allied species with slightly different grades of difference have been subsequently discovered. All the foregoing rules and aids and difficulties in classification may be explained, if I do not greatly deceive myself, on the view that the natural system is founded on descent with modification, that the characters which naturalists consider as showing true affinity between any two or more species are those which have been inherited from a common parent, all true classification being genealogical, that community of descent is the hidden bond which naturalists have been unconsciously seeking, and not some unknown plan of creation, or the enunciation of general propositions and the mere putting together and separating objects more or less alike. But I must explain my meaning more fully. I believe that the arrangement of the groups within each class, in due subordination and relation to each other, must be strictly genealogical in order to be natural but that the amount of difference in the several branches or groups, though allied in the same degree in blood to their common progenitor, may differ greatly, being due to the different degrees of modification which they have undergone. And this is expressed by the forms being ranked under different genera, families, sections, or orders. The reader will best understand what is meant if he will take the trouble to refer to the diagram in the fourth chapter. We will suppose the letters A to L to represent allied genera existing during the Silurian epoch, and descended from some still earlier form. In three of these genera, A, F, and I, a species has transmitted modified descendants to the present day, represented by the fifteen genera A14 to Z14 on the uppermost horizontal line. Now all these modified descendants from a single species are related in blood or descent in the same degree. They may metaphorically be called cousins to the same millionth degree, yet they differ widely and in different degrees from each other. The forms descended from A, now broken up into two or three families, constitute a distinct order from those descended from I, also broken up into two families nor can the existing species descended from A be ranked in the same genus with the parent A. 
or those from I with parent I. But the existing genus F14 may be supposed to have been but slightly modified, and it will then rank with the parent genus F just as some few still living organisms belong to Silurian genera, so that the comparative value of the difference between these organic beings, which are all related to each other in the same degree in blood, has come to be widely different. Nevertheless, their genealogical arrangement remains strictly true, not only at the present time, but at each successive period of descent. All the modified descendants from A will have inherited something in common from their common parent, as will all the descendants from I. So will it be with each subordinate branch of descendants at each successive stage. If, however, we suppose any descendant of A or of I to have become so much modified as to have lost all traces of its parentage, in this case its place in the natural system will be lost, as seems to have occurred with some few existing organisms. All the descendants of the genus F, along its whole line of descent, are supposed to have been but little modified, and they form a single genus. But this genus, though much isolated, will still occupy its proper intermediate position. The representation of the groups as here given in the diagram on a flat surface is much too simple. The branches ought to have diverged in all directions. If the names of the groups had been simply written down in a linear series, the representation would have been still less natural, and it is notoriously not possible to represent in a series on a flat surface the affinities which we discover in nature among the beings of the same group. Thus the natural system is genealogical in its arrangement, like a pedigree, but the amount of modification which the different groups have undergone has to be expressed by ranking them under different so-called genera, subfamilies, families, sections, orders, and classes. It may be worth while to illustrate this view of classification by taking the case of languages. If we possessed a perfect pedigree of mankind, a genealogical arrangement of the races of man would afford the best classification of the various languages now spoken throughout the world. And if all extinct languages and all intermediate and slowly changing dialects were to be included, such an arrangement would be the only possible one. Yet it might be that some ancient languages had altered very little, and had given rise to few new languages while others had altered much, owing to the spreading, isolation, and state of civilization of the several co-descended races, and had thus given rise to many new dialects and languages. The various degrees of difference between the languages of the same stock would have to be expressed by groups subordinate to groups, but the proper, or even the only possible, arrangement would still be genealogical and this would be strictly natural, as it would connect together all the languages, extinct and recent, by the closest affinities, and would give the filiation and the origin of each tongue. In confirmation of this view, let us glance at the classification of varieties which are known or believed to be descended from a single species. These are grouped under the species, with the sub-varieties under the varieties, and in some cases, as with the domestic pigeon, with several other grades of difference. Nearly the same rules are followed as in classifying species. Authors have insisted on the necessity of arranging varieties on a natural instead of an artificial system. We are cautioned, for instance, not to class two varieties of the pineapple together merely because their fruit, though the most important part, happens to be nearly identical. No one puts the Swedish and common turnip together, though the esculent and thickened stems are so similar. Whatever part is found to be most constant is used in classing varieties. Thus the great agriculturist, Marshall, says the horns are very useful for this purpose with cattle, because they are less variable than the shape or colour of the body, etc., whereas with sheep the horns are much less serviceable 
because less constant. In classing varieties, I apprehend that if we had a real pedigree, a genealogical classification would be universally preferred, and it has been attempted in some cases. For we might feel sure, whether there had been more or less modification, that the principle of inheritance would keep the forms together which were allied in the greatest number of points. In tumbler pigeons, though some of the sub-varieties differ in the important character of the length of the beak, yet all are kept together from having the common habit of tumbling. But the short-faced breed has nearly or quite lost this habit. Nevertheless, without any thought on the subject, these tumblers are kept in the same group, because allied in blood and alike in some other respects. With species in a state of nature, every naturalist has in fact brought descent into his classification, for he includes in his lowest grade, that of species, the two sexes, and how enormously these some differ in the most important characters is known to every naturalist. Scarcely a single fact can be predicated in common of the adult males and hermaphrodites, of certain cirripedes, and yet no one dreams of separating them. As soon as the three orchidean forms Monocanthus, Myanthus, and Catacetum, which had previously been ranked as three distinct genera, were known to be sometimes produced on the same plant, they were immediately considered as varieties, and now I have been able to show that they are the male, female, and hermaphrodite forms of the same species. The naturalist includes as one species the various larval stages of the same individual, however much they may differ from each other and from the adult, as well as the so-called alternate generations of Steenstrup, which can only in a technical sense be considered as the same individual. He includes monsters and varieties, not from their partial resemblance to the parent form, but because they are descended from it. As descent has universally been used in classing together the individuals of the same species, though the males and females and larvae are sometimes extremely different, and as it has been used in classing varieties which have undergone a certain and sometimes a considerable amount of modification, may not this same element of descent have been unconsciously used in grouping species under genera, and genera under higher groups, all under the so-called natural system? I believe it has been unconsciously used, and thus only can I understand the several rules and guides which have been followed by our best systematists. As we have no written pedigrees, we are forced to trace community of descent by resemblances of any kind. Therefore we choose those characters which are the least likely to have been modified in relation to the conditions of life to which each species has been recently exposed. Rudimentary structures, on this view, are as good as or even sometimes better than other parts of the organization. We care not how trifling a character may be, let it be the mere inflection of the angle of the jaw, the manner in which an insect's wing is folded, whether the skin be covered by hair or feathers. If it prevail throughout many and different species, especially those having very different habits of life, it assumes high value, for we can account for its presence in so many forms with such different habits only by inheritance from a common parent. We may err in this respect in regard to single points of structure, but when several characters, let them be ever so trifling, concur throughout a large group of beings having different habits, we may feel almost sure on the theory of descent, that these characters have been inherited from a common ancestor, and we know that such aggregated characters have a special value in classification. We can understand why a species, or a group of species, may depart from its allies in several of its most important characteristics, and yet be safely classed with them. This may be safely done, and is often done, as long as a sufficient number of characters, let them be ever so unimportant, betrays the hidden bond of community of descent. Let two forms have not a single character in common, 
yet if these extreme forms are connected together by a chain of intermediate groups, we may at once infer their community of descent, and we put them all into the same class. As we find organs of high physiological importance, those which serve to preserve life under the most diverse conditions of existence, are generally the most constant, we attach especial value to them. But if these same organs, in another group or section of a group, are found to differ much, we at once value them less in our classification. We shall presently see why embryological characters are of such high classificatory importance. Geographical distribution may sometimes be brought usefully into play in classing large genera, because all the species of the same genus, inhabiting any distinct and isolated region, are in all probability descended from the same parents. Analogical Resemblances We can understand, on the above views, the very important distinction between real affinities and analogical or adaptive resemblances. Lamarck first called attention to this subject, and he has been ably followed by Maclee and others. The resemblance in the shape of the body and in the fin-like anterior limbs between dugongs and whales, and between these two orders of mammals and fishes, are analogical. So is the resemblance between a mouse and a shrew-mouse, sorex, which belong to different orders and the still closer resemblance, insisted on by Mr. Mivart, between the mouse and a small marsupial animal, Antichinus, of Australia. These latter resemblances may be accounted for, as it seems to me, by adaptation for similarly active movements through thickets and herbage, together with concealment from enemies. Among insects there are innumerable instances. Thus Linnaeus, misled by external appearances, actually classed an homopterous insect as a moth. We see something of the same kind even with our domestic varieties, as in the strikingly similar shape of the body in the improved breeds of the Chinese and common pig, which are descended from distinct species, and in the similarly thickened stems of the common and specifically distinct Swedish turnip. The resemblance between the greyhound and racehorse is hardly more fanciful than the analogies which have been drawn by some authors between widely different animals. On the view of characters being of real importance for classification, only in so far as they reveal descent, we can clearly understand why analogical or adaptive characters, although of the utmost importance to the welfare of the being, are almost valueless to the systematist. For animals belonging to two most distinct lines of descent may have become adapted to similar conditions, and thus have assumed a close external resemblance, but such resemblances will not reveal, will rather tend to conceal, their blood relationship. We can thus also understand the apparent paradox that the very same characters are analogical when one group is compared with another, but give true affinities when the members of the same group are compared together. Thus, the shape of the body and fin-like limbs are only analogical when whales are compared with fishes, being adaptations in both classes for swimming through the water. But between the several members of the whale family, the shape of the body and the fin-like limbs offer characters exhibiting true affinity, for as these parts are so nearly similar throughout the whole family, we cannot doubt that they have been inherited from a common ancestor. So it is with fishes. Numerous cases could be given of striking resemblances in quite distinct beings between single parts or organs which have been adapted for the same functions. A good instance is afforded by the close resemblance of the jaws of the dog and Tasmanian wolf or thylacinus, animals which are widely sundered in the natural system. But this resemblance is confined to general appearance, as in the prominence of the canines, and in the cutting shape of the molar teeth, for the teeth really differ much. Thus the dog has on each side of the upper jaw four premolars and only two molars, while the thylacinus has three premolars and four molars. The molars also differ much in the two animals in relative size and structure. The adult dentition is preceded by a widely different milk dentition. 
Anyone may, of course, deny that the teeth in either case have been adapted for tearing flesh, through the natural selection of successive variations, but if this be admitted in the one case, it is unintelligible to me that it should be denied in the other. I am glad to find that so high an authority as Professor Flower has come to this same conclusion. The extraordinary cases given in a former chapter of widely different fishes possessing electric organs, of widely different insects possessing luminous organs, and of orchids and asclepiads having pollen masses with viscid discs, come under this same head of analogical resemblances. But these cases are so wonderful that they were introduced as difficulties or objections to our theory. In all such cases some fundamental difference in the growth or development of the parts, and generally in their matured structure, can be detected. The end gained is the same, but the means, though appearing superficially to be the same, are essentially different. The principle formerly alluded to under the term of analogical variation has probably in these cases often come into play, that is, the members of the same class, although only distantly allied, have inherited so much in common in their constitution that they are apt to vary under similar exciting causes in a similar manner, and this would obviously aid in the acquirement through natural selection of parts or organs strikingly like each other, independently of their direct inheritance from a common progenitor. As species belonging to distinct classes have often been adapted by successive slight modifications to live under nearly similar circumstances, to inhabit, for instance, the three elements of land, air, and water, we can perhaps understand how it is that a numerical parallelism has sometimes been observed between the subgroups of distinct classes. A naturalist struck with a parallelism of this nature by arbitrarily raising or sinking the value of the groups in several classes, and all our experience shows that their valuation is as yet arbitrary, could easily extend the parallelism over a wide range, and thus the septenary, quinary, quaternary and ternary classifications have probably arisen. There is another and curious class of cases in which close external resemblance does not depend on adaptation to similar habits of life, but has been gained for the sake of protection. I allude to the wonderful manner in which certain butterflies imitate, as first described by Mr. Bates, other and quite distinct species. This excellent observer has shown that in some districts of South America, where, for instance, an ethomia abounds in gaudy swarms, another butterfly, namely a leptalis, is often found mingled in the same flock, and the latter so closely resembles the ethomia in every shade and stripe of colour, and even in the shape of its wings, that Mr. Bates, with his eyes sharpened by collecting during eleven years, was, though always on his guard, continually deceived. When the mockers and the mocked are caught and compared, they are found to be very different in essential structure, and to belong not only to distinct genera, but often to distinct families. Had this mimicry occurred in only one or two instances, it might have been passed over as a strange coincidence. But if we proceed from a district where one leptalis imitates an ethomia, another mocking and mocked species belonging to the same two genera, equally close in their resemblance, may be found. Altogether, no less than ten genera are enumerated, which include species that imitate other butterflies. The mockers and mocked always inhabit the same region. We never find an imitator living remote from the form which it imitates. The mockers are almost invariably rare insects. The mocked, in almost every case, abounds in swarms. In the same district in which a species of Leptalis closely imitates an ethomia, there are sometimes other Lepidoptera mimicking the same ethomia, so that in the same place a species of three genera of butterflies and even a moth are found all closely resembling a butterfly belonging to a fourth genus. It deserves especial notice that many of the mimicking forms of the Leptalis, as well as of the mimicked forms, can be shown by a graduated series 
to be merely varieties of the same species, while others are undoubtedly distinct species. But why, it may be asked, are certain forms treated as the mimicked and others as the mimickers? Mr. Bates satisfactorily answers this question by showing that the form which is imitated keeps the usual dress of the group to which it belongs, while the counterfeiters have changed their dress and do not resemble their nearest allies. We are next led to inquire what reason can be assigned for certain butterflies and moths so often assuming the dress of another and quite distinct form. Why, to the perplexity of naturalists, has nature condescended to the tricks of the stage? Mr. Bates has no doubt hit on the true explanation. The mocked forms, which always abound in numbers, must habitually escape destruction to a large extent, otherwise they could not exist in such swarms, and a large amount of evidence has now been collected showing that they are distasteful to birds and other insect-devouring animals. The mocking forms, on the other hand, that inhabit the same district, are comparatively rare, and belong to rare groups. Hence, they must suffer habitually from some danger, for otherwise, from the number of eggs laid by all butterflies, they would, in three or four generations, swarm over the whole country. Now, if a member of one of these persecuted and rare groups were to assume a dress so like that of a well-protected species, that it continually deceived the practised eyes of an entomologist, it would often deceive predaceous birds and insects, and thus often escape destruction. Mr. Bates may also be said to have actually witnessed the process by which the mimickers have come so closely to resemble the mimicked, for he found that some of the forms of Leptalis which mimic so many other butterflies varied in an extreme degree. In one district several varieties occurred, and of these one alone resembled, to a certain extent, the common Ithomia of the same district. In another district there were two or three varieties, one of which was much commoner than the others, and this closely mocked another form of Ithomia. From facts of this nature, Mr. Bates concludes that the Leptalis first varies, and when a variety happens to resemble in some degree any common butterfly inhabiting the same district, this variety, from its resemblance to a flourishing and little persecuted kind, has a better chance of escaping destruction from predaceous birds and insects, and is consequently oftener preserved, the less perfect degree of resemblance being generation after generation eliminated, and only the others left to propagate their kind. So that here we have an excellent illustration of natural selection. Monsieur Wallace and Trimmon have likewise described several equally striking cases of imitation in the Lepidoptera of the Malay Archipelago and Africa, and with some other insects. Mr. Wallace has also detected one such case with birds, but we have none with the larger quadrupeds. The much greater frequency of imitation with insects than with other animals is probably the consequence of their small size. Insects cannot defend themselves, excepting indeed the kinds furnished with a sting, and I have never heard of an instance of such kinds mocking other insects, though they are mocked. Insects cannot easily escape by flight from the larger animals which prey on them. Therefore, speaking metaphorically, they are reduced, like most weak creatures, to trickery and dissimulation. It should be observed that the process of imitation probably never commenced between forms widely dissimilar in colour, but starting with species already somewhat like each other, the closest resemblance, if beneficial, could readily be gained by the above means, and if the imitated form was subsequently and gradually modified through any agency, the imitating form would be led along the same track, and thus be altered to almost any extent so that it might ultimately assume an appearance or colouring wholly unlike that of the other members of the family to which it belonged. There is, however, some difficulty on this head, for it is necessary to suppose in some cases that ancient members belonging to several distinct groups, before they had diverged to their present extent, accidentally resembled a member of another and protected group 
in a sufficient degree to afford some slight protection, this having given the basis for the subsequent acquisition of the most perfect resemblance. End of chapter 14, section 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Peter Yearsley. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter number 14. Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings, Morphology, Embryology, Rudimentary Organs. Section 2. On the Nature of the Affinities Connecting Organic Beings. As the modified descendants of dominant species, belonging to the larger genera, tend to inherit the advantages which made the groups to which they belong large, and their parents dominant, they are almost sure to spread widely and to seize on more and more places in the economy of nature. The larger and more dominant groups within each class thus tend to go on increasing in size, and they consequently supplant many smaller and feebler groups. Thus we can account for the fact that all organisms, recent and extinct, are included under a few great orders, and under still fewer classes. As showing how few the higher groups are in number, and how widely they are spread throughout the world, the fact is striking that the discovery of Australia has not added an insect belonging to a new class, and that in the vegetable kingdom, as I learn from Dr. Hooker, it has added only two or three families of small size. In the chapter on geological succession, I attempted to show, on the principle of each group having generally diverged much in character, during the long-continued process of modification, how it is that the more ancient forms of life often present characters in some degree intermediate between existing groups. As some few of the old and intermediate forms, having transmitted to the present-day descendants but little modified, these constitute our so-called osculant or aberrant groups. The more aberrant any form is, the greater must be the number of connecting forms which have been exterminated and utterly lost. And we have evidence of aberrant groups having suffered severely from extinction, for they are almost always represented by extremely few species, and such species as do occur are generally very distinct from each other, which again implies extinction. The genera Ornithorhynchus and Lepidosiren, for example, would not have been less aberrant had each been represented by a dozen species, instead of, as at present, by a single one, or by two or three. We can, I think, account for this fact only by looking at aberrant groups as forms which have been conquered by more successful competitors, with a few members still preserved under unusually favourable conditions. Mr. Waterhouse has remarked that when a member belonging to one group of animals exhibits an affinity to a quite distinct group, this affinity in most cases is general and not special. Thus, according to Mr. Waterhouse, of all rodents, the bizcacha is most nearly related to marsupials, but in the points in which it approaches this order, its relations are general, that is, not to any one marsupial species more than to another. As these points of affinity are believed to be real, and not merely adaptive, they must be due, in accordance with our views, to inheritance from a common progenitor. Therefore, we must suppose either that all rodents, including the bizcatcher, branched off from some ancient marsupial, which will naturally have been more or less intermediate in character with respect to all existing marsupials, or that both rodents and marsupials branched off from a common progenitor, and that both groups have since undergone much modification in divergent directions. On either view, we must suppose that the bizcatcher has retained by inheritance more of the character of its ancient progenitor than have other rodents, and therefore it will not be specially related to any one existing marsupial, 
but indirectly to all, or nearly all, marsupials, from having partially retained the character of their common progenitor, or of some early member of the group. On the other hand, of all marsupials, as Mr. Waterhouse has remarked, the phascolomys resembles most nearly not any one species, but the general order of rodents. In this case, however, it may be strongly suspected that the resemblance is only analogical, owing to the phascolomys having become adapted to habits like that of a rodent. The elder de Candolle has made nearly similar observations on the general nature of the affinities of distinct families of plants. On the principle of the multiplication and gradual diversions in character of the species descended from a common progenitor, together with their retention by inheritance of some characters in common, we can understand the excessively complex and radiating affinities by which all the members of the same family or higher group are connected together. For the common progenitor of a whole family, now broken up by extinction into distinct groups and subgroups, will have transmitted some of its characters, modified in various ways and degrees, to all the species, and they will consequently be related to each other by circuitous lines of affinity of various lengths as may be seen in the diagram so often referred to, mounting up through many predecessors. As it is difficult to show the blood relationship between the numerous kindred of any ancient and noble family, even by the aid of a genealogical tree, and almost impossible to do so without this aid, we can understand the extraordinary difficulty which naturalists have experienced in describing, without the aid of a diagram, the various affinities which they perceive between the many living and extinct members of the same great natural class. Extinction, as we have seen in the fourth chapter, has played an important part in defining and widening the intervals between the several groups in each class. We may thus account for the distinctness of whole classes from each other, for instance of birds from all other vertebrate animals, by the belief that many ancient forms of life have been utterly lost, through which the early progenitors of birds were formerly connected with the early progenitors of the other, and at that time less differentiated, vertebrate classes. There has been much less extinction of the forms of life which once connected fishes with batrachians. There has been still less within some whole classes, for instance the crustacea, for here the most wonderfully diverse forms are still linked together by a long and only partially broken chain of affinities. Extinction has only defined the groups, it has by no means made them. For if every form which has ever lived on this earth were suddenly to reappear, though it would be quite impossible to give definitions by which each group could be distinguished, still a natural classification, or at least a natural arrangement, would be possible. We shall see this by turning to the diagram. The letters A to L may represent eleven Silurian genera, some of which have produced large groups of modified descendants, with every link in each branch and sub-branch still alive, and the links not greater than those between existing varieties. In this case it would be quite impossible to give definitions by which the several members of the several groups could be distinguished from their more immediate parents and descendants yet the arrangement in the diagram would still hold good, and would be natural. For on the principle of inheritance, all the forms descended, for instance from A, would have something in common. In a tree we can distinguish this or that branch, though at the actual fork the two unite and blend together. We could not, as I have said, define the several groups, but we could pick out types or forms representing most of the characters of each group, whether large or small, and thus give a general idea of the value of the differences between them. This is what we should be driven to, if we were ever to succeed in collecting all the forms in any one class which have lived throughout all time and space. Assuredly, we shall never succeed in making so perfect a collection. Nevertheless, in certain classes, we are tending towards this end, and Milne Edwards has lately insisted, in an able paper, on the high importance of looking to types, whether or not we can separate and define the groups to which such types belong. 
Finally, we have seen that natural selection, which follows from the struggle for existence, and which almost inevitably leads to extinction and divergence of character in the descendants from any one parent species, explains that great and universal feature in the affinities of all organic beings, namely their subordination in group under group. We use the element of descent in classing the individuals of both sexes and of all ages under one species, although they may have but few characters in common. We use descent in classing acknowledged varieties, however different they may be from their parents, and I believe that this element of descent is the hidden bond of connection which naturalists have sought under the term of the natural system. On this idea of the natural system being, in so far as it has been perfected, genealogical in its arrangement, with the grades of difference expressed by the terms genera, families, orders, etc., we can understand the rules which we are compelled to follow in our classification. We can understand why we value certain resemblances far more than others, why we use rudimentary and useless organs, or others of trifling physiological importance, why, in finding the relations between one group and another, we summarily reject analogical or adaptive characters, and yet use these same characters within the limits of the same group. We can clearly see how it is that all living and extinct forms can be grouped together within a few great classes, and how the several members of each class are connected together by the most complex and radiating lines of affinities. We shall never, probably, disentangle the inextricable web of the affinities between the members of any one class, but when we have a distinct object in view, and do not look to some unknown plan of creation, we may hope to make sure but slow progress. Professor Heikel, in his General Morphologie, and in another work, has recently brought his great knowledge and abilities to bear on what he calls phylogeny, or the lines of descent of all organic beings. In drawing up the several series, he trusts chiefly to embryological characters, but receives aid from homologous and rudimentary organs, as well as from the successive periods at which the various forms of life are believed to have first appeared in our geological formations. He has thus boldly made a great beginning, and shows us how classification will in the future be treated. Morphology We have seen that the members of the same class, independently of their habits of life, resemble each other in the general plan of their organization. This resemblance is often expressed by the term unity of type, or by saying that the several parts and organs in the different species of the class are homologous. The whole subject is included under the general term of morphology. This is one of the most interesting departments of natural history, and may almost be said to be its very soul. What can be more curious than that the hand of a man formed for grasping, that of a mole for digging, the leg of the horse, the paddle of the porpoise, and the wing of the bat, should all be constructed on the same pattern, and should include similar bones in the same relative positions. How curious it is, to give a subordinate though striking instance, that the hind feet of the kangaroo, which are so well fitted for bounding over the open plains, those of the climbing leaf-eating koala equally well fitted for grasping the branches of trees, those of the ground-dwelling, insect or root-eating bandicoots, and those of some other Australian marsupials, should all be constructed on the same extraordinary type, namely with the bones of the second and third digits extremely slender and enveloped within the same skin, so that they appear like a single toe furnished with two claws. Notwithstanding this similarity of pattern, it is obvious that the hind feet of these several animals are used for as widely different purposes as it is possible to conceive. The case is rendered all the more striking by the American opossums, which follow nearly the same habits of life as some of their Australian relatives, having feet constructed on the ordinary plan. Professor Flower, from whom these statements are taken, remarks in conclusion, We may call this conformity to type, without getting much nearer to an explanation of the phenomenon. And he then adds, But is it not powerfully suggestive of true relationship, of inheritance from a common ancestor? Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, 
has strongly insisted on the high importance of relative position or connection in homologous parts. They may differ to almost any extent in form and size, and yet remain connected together in the same invariable order. We never find, for instance, the bones of the arm and forearm, or of the thigh and leg, transposed. Hence the same names can be given to the homologous bones in widely different animals. We see the same great law in the construction of the mouths of insects. What can be more different than the immensely long spiral proboscis of a sphinx moth, the curious folded one of a bee or bug, and the great jaws of a beetle? Yet all these organs, serving for such widely different purposes, are formed by infinitely numerous modifications of an upper lip, mandibles, and two pairs of maxillae. The same law governs the construction of the mouths and limbs of crustaceans. So it is with the flowers of plants. Nothing can be more hopeless than to attempt to explain this similarity of pattern in members of the same class by utility or by the doctrine of final causes. The hopelessness of the attempt has been expressly admitted by Owen in his most interesting work on the nature of limbs. On the ordinary view of the independent creation of each being, we can only say that so it is, that it has pleased the Creator to construct all the animals and plants in each great class on a uniform plan. But this is not a scientific explanation. The explanation is to a large extent simple, on the theory of the selection of successive slight modifications, each being profitable in some way to the modified form, but often affecting by correlation other parts of the organization. In changes of this nature there will be little or no tendency to alter the original pattern, or to transpose the parts. The bones of a limb might be shortened and flattened to any extent, becoming at the same time enveloped in thick membrane, so as to serve as a fin. Or a webbed hand might have all its bones, or certain bones, lengthened to any extent, with the membrane connecting them increased, so as to serve as a wing. Yet all these modifications would not tend to alter the framework of the bones, or the relative connection of the parts. If we suppose that an early progenitor, the archetype as it may be called, of all mammals, birds, and reptiles, had its limbs constructed on the existing general pattern, for whatever purpose they served, we can at once perceive the plain signification of the homologous construction of the limbs throughout the class. So, with the mouths of insects, we have only to suppose that their common progenitor had an upper lip, mandibles, and two pairs of maxillae, these parts being perhaps very simple in form, and then natural selection will account for the infinite diversity in structure and function of the mouths of insects. Nevertheless, it is conceivable that the general pattern of an organ might become so much obscured as to be finally lost, by the reduction and ultimately by the complete abortion of certain parts, by the fusion of other parts, and by the doubling or multiplication of others, variations which we know to be within the limits of possibility. In the paddles of the gigantic extinct sea lizards, and in the mouths of certain sectorial crustaceans, the general pattern seems thus to have become partially obscured. There is another and equally curious branch of our subject, namely serial homologies, or the comparison of the different parts or organs in the same individual, and not of the same parts or organs in different members of the same class. Most physiologists believe that the bones of the skull are homologous, that is, correspond in number and in relative connection, with the elemental parts of a certain number of vertebrae. The anterior and posterior limbs in all the higher vertebrate classes are plainly homologous. So it is with the wonderfully complex jaws and legs of crustaceans. It is familiar to almost every one that in a flower the relative positions of the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils, as well as their intimate structure, are intelligible on the view that they consist of metamorphosed leaves, arranged in a spire. In monstrous plants we often get direct evidence of the possibility of one organ being transformed into another, and we can actually see, during the early or embryonic stages of development in flowers, as well as in crustaceans and many other animals, that organs which when mature become extremely different are at first exactly alike. 
How inexplicable are the cases of serial homologies on the ordinary view of creation! Why should the brain be enclosed in a box composed of such numerous and such extraordinarily shaped pieces of bone, apparently representing vertebrae? As Owen has remarked, the benefit derived from the yielding of the separate pieces in the act of parturition by mammals will by no means explain the same construction in the skulls of birds and reptiles. Why should similar bones have been created to form the wing and the leg of a bat, used as they are for such totally different purposes, namely flying and walking? Why should one crustacean, which has an extremely complex mouth formed of many parts, consequently always have fewer legs? Or conversely, those with many legs have simpler mouths? Why should the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils in each flower, though fitted for such distinct purposes, be all constructed on the same pattern? On the theory of natural selection, we can to a certain extent answer these questions. We need not here consider how the bodies of some animals first became divided into a series of segments, or how they became divided into right and left sides with corresponding organs for such questions are almost beyond investigation. It is, however, probable that some serial structures are the result of cells multiplying by division, entailing the multiplication of the parts developed from such cells. It must suffice for our purpose to bear in mind that an indefinite repetition of the same part or organ is the common characteristic, as Owen has remarked, of all low or little specialized forms. Therefore the unknown progenitor of the vertebrata probably possessed many vertebrae, the unknown progenitor of the articulata many segments, and the unknown progenitor of flowering plants many leaves arranged in one or more spires. We have also formerly seen that parts many times repeated are eminently liable to vary, not only in a number, but in form. Consequently, such parts, being already present in considerable numbers, and being highly variable, would naturally afford the materials for adaptation to the most different purposes, yet they would generally retain, through the force of inheritance, plain traces of their original or fundamental resemblance. They would retain this resemblance all the more, as the variations, which afforded the basis for their subsequent modification through natural selection, would tend from the first to be similar, the parts being at an early stage of growth alike, and being subjected to nearly the same conditions. Such parts, whether more or less modified, unless their common origin became wholly obscured, would be serially homologous. In the great class of mollusks, though the parts in distinct species can be shown to be homologous, only a few serial homologies such as the valves of chitons, can be indicated. That is, we are seldom enabled to say that one part is homologous with another part in the same individual. And we can understand this fact, for in mollusks, even in the lowest members of the class, we do not find nearly so much indefinite repetition of any one part as we find in the other great classes of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. But morphology is a much more complex subject than it at first appears, as has lately been well shown in a remarkable paper by Mr. E. Ray Lancaster, who has drawn an important distinction between certain classes of cases which have all been equally ranked by naturalists as homologous. He proposes to call the structures which resemble each other in distinct animals, owing to their descent from a common progenitor with subsequent modification, homogeneous, and the resemblances which cannot thus be accounted for he proposes to call homoplastic. For instance, he believes that the hearts of birds and mammals are, as a whole, homogeneous, that is, have been derived from a common progenitor, but that the four cavities of the heart in the two classes are homoplastic, that is, have been independently developed. Mr. Lancaster also adduces the close resemblance of the parts on the right and left sides of the body and in the successive segments of the same individual animal, and here we have parts commonly called homologous, which bear no relation to the descent of distinct species from a common progenitor. 
homoplastic structures are the same with those which I have classed, though in a very imperfect manner, as analogous modifications or resemblances. Their formation may be attributed in part to distinct organisms, or to distinct parts of the same organism, having varied in an analogous manner, and in part to similar modifications having been preserved for the same general purpose or function, of which many instances have been given. Naturalists frequently speak of the skull as formed of metamorphosed vertebrae, the jaws of crabs as metamorphosed legs, the stamens and pistils in flowers as metamorphosed leaves. But it would, in most cases, be more correct, as Professor Huxley has remarked, to speak of both skull and vertebrae, jaws and legs, etc., as having been metamorphosed not one from the other, as they now exist, but from some common and simpler element. Most naturalists, however, use such language only in a metaphorical sense. They are far from meaning that during a long course of descent, primordial organs of any kind, vertebrae in the one case, and legs in the other, have actually been converted into skulls or jaws. Yet so strong is the appearance of this having occurred, that naturalists can hardly avoid employing language having this plain signification. According to the views here maintained, such language may be used literally, and the wonderful fact of the jaws, for instance, of a crab, retaining numerous characters, which they probably would have retained through inheritance, if they had really been metamorphosed from true, though extremely simple legs, is in part explained. DEVELOPMENT AND EMBRYOLOGY This is one of the most important subjects in the whole round of natural history. The metamorphoses of insects, with which everyone is familiar, are generally effected abruptly by a few stages, but the transformations are in reality numerous and gradual, though concealed. A certain ephemerous insect, Chloeon, during its development, molts, as shown by Sir J. Lubbock, above twenty times, and each time undergoes a certain amount of change, and in this case we see the act of metamorphosis performed in a primary and gradual manner. Many insects, and especially certain crustaceans, show us what wonderful changes of structure can be effected during development. Such changes, however, reach their acme in the so-called alternate generations of some of the lower animals. It is, for instance, an astonishing fact that a delicate branching coralline studded with polypi and attached to a submarine rock should produce, first by budding and then by transverse division, a host of huge floating jellyfishes, and that these should produce eggs from which are hatched swimming animalcules which attach themselves to rocks and become developed into branching corallines, and so on in an endless cycle. The belief in the essential identity of the process of alternate generation and of ordinary metamorphosis has been greatly strengthened by Wagner's discovery of the larva or maggot of a fly, namely the Cecidomyia, producing asexually other larvae, and these others, which finally are developed into mature males and females, propagating their kind in the ordinary manner by eggs. It may be worth notice that when Wagner's remarkable discovery was first announced, I was asked how it was possible to account for the larvae of this fly having acquired the power of a sexual reproduction. As long as the case remained unique, no answer could be given. But already Grimm has shown that another fly, a Chironomus, reproduces itself in nearly the same manner, and he believes that this occurs frequently in the order. It is the pupa, and not the larva, of the Chironomus which has this power, and Grimm further shows that this case, to a certain extent, unites that of the Cecidomyia with the parthenogenesis of the coccidae, the term parthenogenesis implying that the mature females of the coccidae are capable of producing fertile eggs without the concourse of the male. Certain animals belonging to several classes are now known to have the power of ordinary reproduction at an unusually early age, and we have only to accelerate parthenogenetic reproduction by gradual steps to an earlier and earlier age, Chironomus showing us an almost exactly intermediate stage, that is, that of the pupa, and we can perhaps account for the marvellous case of the Cecidomyia. It has already been stated that various parts in the same individual, which are exactly alike during an early embryonic period, 
become widely different and serve for widely different purposes in the adult stage. So again it has been shown that generally the embryos of the most distinct species belonging to the same class are closely similar, but become, when fully developed, widely dissimilar. A better proof of this latter fact cannot be given than the statement by von Baer, the embryos of mammalia, of birds, lizards, and snakes, probably also of chelonia, are in the earliest stages exceedingly like one another, both as a whole and in the mode of development of their parts, so much so, in fact, that we can often distinguish the embryos only by their size. In my possession are two little embryos in spirit, whose names I have omitted to attach, and at present I am quite unable to say to what class they belong. They may be lizards or small birds, or very young mammalia. So complete is the similarity in the mode of formation of the head and trunk in these animals. The extremities, however, are still absent in these embryos. But even if they had existed in the earliest stage of their development, we should learn nothing. For the feet of lizards and mammals, the wings and feet of birds, no less than the hands and feet of man, all arise from the same fundamental form. The larvae of most crustaceans at corresponding stages of development closely resemble each other, however different the adults may become, and so it is with very many other animals. A trace of the law of embryonic resemblance occasionally lasts till a rather late age. Thus birds of the same genus and of allied genera often resemble each other in their immature plumage, as we see in the spotted feathers in the young of the thrush group. In the cat tribe, most of the species, when adult, are striped or spotted in lines, and stripes or spots can be plainly distinguished in the whelp of the lion and the puma. We occasionally, though rarely, see something of the same kind in plants, thus the first leaves of the ulex or furze, and the first leaves of the phylodineous acacias, are pinnate, or divided like the ordinary leaves of the leguminosae. The points of structure in which the embryos of widely different animals within the same class resemble each other often have no direct relation to their conditions of existence. We cannot, for instance, suppose that in the embryos of the vertebrata the peculiar loop-like courses of the arteries near the branchial slits are related to similar conditions, in the young mammal which is nourished in the womb of its mother, in the egg of the bird which is hatched in a nest, and in the spawn of a frog under water. We have no more reason to believe in such a relation than we have to believe that the similar bones in the hand of a man, wing of a bat, and fin of a porpoise are related to similar conditions of life. No one supposes that the stripes on the whelp of a lion, or the spots on the young blackbird, are of any use to these animals. The case, however, is different when an animal, during any part of its embryonic career, is active and has to provide for itself. The period of activity may come on earlier or later in life, but whenever it comes on, the adaptation of the larva to its conditions of life is just as perfect and as beautiful as in the adult animal. In how important a manner this has acted has recently been well shown by Sir J. Lubbock in his remarks on the close similarity of the larvae of some insects belonging to very different orders, and on the dissimilarity of the larvae of other insects within the same order according to their habits of life. Owing to such adaptations, the similarity of the larvae of allied animals is sometimes greatly obscured, especially when there is a division of labour during the different stages of development, as when the same larva has during one stage to search for food, and during another stage has to search for a place of attachment. Cases can even be given of the larvae of allied species, or groups of species, differing more from each other than do the adults. In most cases, however, the larvae, though active, still obey more or less closely the law of common embryonic resemblance. Cirripedes afford a good instance of this. Even the illustrious Cuvier did not perceive that a barnacle was a crustacean, but a glance at the larva shows this in an unmistakable manner. So again, the two main divisions of cirripedes, the pedunculated and sessile, though differing widely in external appearance, have larvae in all their stages barely distinguishable. The embryo in the course of development generally rises in organization. I use this expression, though I am aware that it is hardly possible to define clearly 
what is meant by organization being higher or lower. But no one probably will dispute that the butterfly is higher than the caterpillar. In some cases, however, the mature animal must be considered as lower in the scale than the larva, as with certain parasitic crustaceans. To refer once again to cirripedes, the larvae in the first stage have three pairs of locomotive organs, a simple single eye, and a probosiformed mouth, with which they feed largely, for they increase much in size. In the second stage, answering to the chrysalis stage of butterflies, they have six pairs of beautifully constructed natatory legs, a pair of magnificent compound eyes, and extremely complex antennae. But they have a closed and imperfect mouth, and cannot feed. Their function at this stage is to search out by their well-developed organs of sense, and to reach by their active powers of swimming, a proper place on which to become attached, and to undergo their final metamorphosis. When this is completed, they are fixed for life. Their legs are now converted into prehensile organs. They again obtain a well-constructed mouth, but they have no antennae, and their two eyes are now reconverted into a minute, single, simple eye-spot. In this last and complete state, cirripedes may be considered as either more highly or more lowly organized than they were in the larval condition. But in some genera, the larvae become developed into hermaphrodites having the ordinary structure, or into what I have called complemental males, and in the latter the development has assuredly been retrograde, for the male is a mere sac which lives for a short time and is destitute of mouth, stomach, and every other organ of importance, excepting those for reproduction. We are so much accustomed to see a difference in structure between the embryo and the adult, that we are tempted to look at this difference as in some necessary manner contingent on growth. But there is no reason why, for instance, the wing of a bat or the fin of a porpoise should not have been sketched out with all their parts in proper proportion, as soon as any part became visible. In some whole groups of animals, and in certain members of other groups, this is the case, and the embryo does not at any period differ widely from the adult. Thus, Owen has remarked in regard to cuttlefish, There is no metamorphosis. The cephalopodic character is manifested long before the parts of the embryo are completed. Land shells and freshwater crustaceans are born having their proper forms, while the marine members of the same two great classes pass through considerable and often great changes during their development. Spiders, again, barely undergo any metamorphosis. The larvae of most insects pass through a worm-like stage, whether they are adaptive and adapted to diversified habits, or are inactive from being placed in the midst of proper nutriment, or from being fed by their parents. But in a few cases, as in that of Aphis, if we look to the admirable drawings of the development of this insect by Professor Huxley, we see hardly any trace of the vermiform stage. Sometimes it is only the earlier developmental stages which fail. Thus Fritz Müller has made the remarkable discovery that certain shrimp-like crustaceans allied to Pinoyus first appear under the simple Norpleus form, and after passing through two or more Zoea stages, and then through the Mysis stage, finally acquire their mature structure. Now in the whole great Malacostrican order to which these crustaceans belong, no other member is as yet known to be first developed under the Norpleus form, though many appear as zoias. Nevertheless, Muller assigns reasons for his belief that if there had been no suppression of development, all these crustaceans would have appeared as Norplii. How, then, can we explain these several facts in embryology, namely, the very general, though not universal, difference in structure between the embryo and the adult, the various parts in the same individual embryo, which ultimately become very unlike, and serve for diverse purposes, being at an early period of growth alike, the common but not invariable resemblance between the embryos or larvae of the most distinct species in the same class, the embryo often retaining, while within the egg or womb, structures which are of no service to it, either at that or at a later period of life. On the other hand, larvae which have to provide for their own wants, being perfectly adapted to the surrounding conditions, and lastly, the fact of certain larvae standing higher on the scale of organization 
than the mature animal into which they are developed. I believe that all these facts can be explained as follows. It is commonly assumed, perhaps from monstrosities affecting the embryo at a very early period, that slight variations or individual differences necessarily appear at an equally early period. We have little evidence on this head, but what we have certainly points the other way, for it is notorious that breeders of cattle, horses, and various fancy animals cannot positively tell, until some time after birth, what will be the merits and demerits of their young animals. We see this plainly in our own children. We cannot tell whether a child will be tall or short, or what its precise features will be. The question is not at what period of life any variation may have been caused, but at what period the effects are displayed. The cause may have acted, and I believe often has acted, on one or both parents before the act of generation. It deserves notice that it is of no importance to a very young animal, as long as it is nourished and protected by its parent, whether most of its characters are acquired a little earlier or later in life. It would not signify, for instance, to a bird which obtained its food by having a much curved beak, whether or not, while young, it possessed a beak of this shape, as long as it was fed by its parents. I have stated in the first chapter that at whatever age any variation first appears in the parent, it tends to reappear at a corresponding age in the offspring. Certain variations can only appear at corresponding ages, for instance, peculiarities in the caterpillar, cocoon, or imago states of the silk moth, or again in the full-grown horns of cattle. But variations which for all that we can see might have appeared either earlier or later in life, likewise tend to reappear at a corresponding age in the offspring and parent. I am far from meaning that this is invariably the case, and I could give several exceptional cases of variations, taking the word in the largest sense, which have supervened at an earlier age in the child than in the parent. These two principles, namely that slight variations generally appear at a not very early period of life, and are inherited at a corresponding not early period, explain, as I believe, all the above specified leading facts in embryology. But first let us look to a few analogous cases in our domestic varieties. Some authors who have written on dogs maintain that the greyhound and bulldog, though so different, are really closely allied varieties, descending from the same wild stock. Hence I was curious to see how far their puppies differed from each other. I was told by breeders that they differed just as much as their parents, and this, judging by the eye, seemed almost to be the case. But on actually measuring the old dogs and their six days old puppies, I found that the puppies had not acquired nearly their full amount of proportional difference. So again I was told that the foals of cart and racehorses, breeds which have been almost wholly formed by selection under domestication, differed as much as the full-grown animals. But having had careful measurements made of the dams and of three days old colts of race and heavy cart-horses, I find that this is by no means the case. As we have conclusive evidence that the breeds of the pigeon are descended from a single wild species, I compared the young pigeons within twelve hours after being hatched. I carefully measured the proportions, but will not here give the details, of the beak, width of mouth, length of nostril and of eyelid, size of feet and length of leg, in the wild parent species, in pouters, fantails, runts, barbs, dragons, carriers, and tumblers. Now, some of these birds, when mature, differ in so extraordinary a manner in the length and form of beak, and in other characters, that they would certainly have been ranked as distinct genera, if found in a state of nature. But when the nestling birds of these several breeds were placed in a row, though most of them could just be distinguished, the proportional differences in the above specified points were incomparably less than in the full-grown birds. Some characteristic points of difference, for instance that of the width of mouth, could hardly be detected in the young. But there was one remarkable exception to this rule, 
for the young of the short-faced tumbler differed from the young of the wild rock-pigeon and of the other breeds in almost exactly the same proportions as in the adult stage. These facts are explained by the above two principles. Fanciers select their dogs, horses, pigeons, etc., for breeding when nearly grown up. They are indifferent whether the desired qualities are acquired earlier or later in life, if the full-grown animal possesses them. And the cases just given, more especially that of the pigeons, show that the characteristic differences which have been accumulated by man's selection, and which give value to his breeds, do not generally appear at a very early period of life, and are inherited at a corresponding not early period. But the case of the short-faced tumbler, which when twelve hours old possessed its proper characters, proves that this is not the universal rule, for here the characteristic differences must either have appeared at an earlier period than usual, or if not so, the differences must have been inherited not at a corresponding, but at an earlier age. Now, let us apply these two principles to species in a state of nature. Let us take a group of birds, descended from some ancient form, and modified through natural selection for different habits. Then, from the many slight successive variations having supervened in the several species at a not early age, and having been inherited at a corresponding age, the young will have been but little modified, and they will still resemble each other much more closely than do the adults, just as we have seen with the breeds of the pigeon. We may extend this view to widely distinct structures and to whole classes. The forelimbs, for instance, which once served as legs to a remote progenitor, may have become, through a long course of modification, adapted in one descendant to act as hands, in another as paddles, in another as wings. But on the above two principles the forelimbs will not have been much modified in the embryos of these several forms although in each form the forelimb will differ greatly in the adult state. Whatever influence long-continued use or disuse may have had in modifying the limbs or other parts of any species, this will chiefly or solely have affected it when nearly mature, when it was compelled to use its full powers to gain its own living, and the effects thus produced will have been transmitted to the offspring at a corresponding nearly mature age. Thus the young will not be modified, or will be modified only in a slight degree, through the effects of the increased use or disuse of parts. With some animals, the successive variations may have supervened at a very early period of life, or the steps may have been inherited at an earlier age than that at which they first occurred. In either of these cases the young or embryo will closely resemble the mature parent form, as we have seen with the short-faced tumbler, and this is the rule of development in certain whole groups, or in certain subgroups alone, as with cuttlefish, land shells, freshwater crustaceans, spiders, and some members of the great class of insects. With respect to the final cause of the young in such groups not passing through any metamorphosis, we can see that this would follow from the following contingencies, namely, from the young having to provide at a very early age for their own wants, and from their following the same habits of life with their parents. For in this case it would be indispensable for their existence that they should be modified in the same manner as their parents. Again, with respect to the singular fact that many terrestrial and freshwater animals do not undergo any metamorphosis, while marine members of the same groups pass through various transformations, Fritz Müller has suggested that the process of slowly modifying and adapting an animal to live on the land or in fresh water, instead of in the sea, would be greatly simplified by its not passing through any larval stage, for it is not probable that places well adapted for both the larval and mature stages, under such new and greatly changed habits of life, would commonly be found unoccupied or ill-occupied by other organisms. In this case, the gradual acquirement at an earlier and earlier age of the adult structure 
would be favoured by natural selection, and all traces of former metamorphoses would finally be lost. If, on the other hand, it profited the young of an animal to follow habits of life slightly different from those of the parent form, and consequently to be constructed on a slightly different plan, or if it profited a larva already different from its parent to change still further, then, on the principle of inheritance at corresponding ages, the young or the larvae might be rendered by natural selection more and more different from their parents to any conceivable extent. Differences in the larva might also become correlated with successive stages of its development, so that the larva in the first stage might come to differ greatly from the larva in the second stage, as is the case with many animals. The adult might also become fitted for sights or habits in which organs of locomotion or of the senses, etc., would be useless, and in this case the metamorphosis would be retrograde. From the remarks just made, we can see how, by changes of structure in the young, in conformity with changed habits of life, together with inheritance at corresponding ages, animals might come to pass through stages of development perfectly distinct from the primordial condition of their adult progenitors. Most of our best authorities are now convinced that the various larval and pupal stages of insects have thus been acquired through adaptation and not through inheritance from some ancient form. The curious case of Citaris, a beetle which passes through certain unusual stages of development, will illustrate how this might occur. The first larval form is described by M. Fabre as an active, minute insect, furnished with six legs, two long antennae, and four eyes. These larvae are hatched in the nests of bees, and when the male bees emerge from their burrows in the spring, which they do before the females, the larvae spring on them, and afterwards crawl on to the females while paired with the males. As soon as the female bee deposits her eggs on the surface of the honey stored in the cells, the larvae of the citaris leap on the eggs and devour them. Afterwards they undergo a complete change. Their eyes disappear, their legs and antennae become rudimentary, and they feed on honey, so that they now more closely resemble the ordinary larvae of insects. Ultimately they undergo a further transformation, and finally emerge as the perfect beetle. Now, if an insect undergoing transformations like those of the Citaris were to become the progenitor of a whole new class of insects, the course of development of the new class would be widely different from that of our existing insects, and the first larval stage certainly would not represent the former condition of any adult and ancient form. On the other hand, it is highly probable that with many animals the embryonic or larval stages show us, more or less completely, the condition of the progenitor of the whole group in its adult state. In the great class of the Crustacea, forms wonderfully distinct from each other, namely suctorial parasites, cirripedes, entomostrica, and even the malacostrica, appear at first as larvae under the nauplius form, and as these larvae live and feed in the open sea, and are not adapted for any peculiar habits of life, and from other reasons assigned by Fritz Müller, it is probable that at some very remote period an independent adult animal resembling the nauplius existed, and subsequently produced, along several divergent lines of descent, the above-named great crustacean groups. So again it is probable, from what we know of the embryos of mammals, birds, fishes, and reptiles, that these animals are the modified descendants of some ancient progenitor, which was furnished in its adult state with branchiae, a swim bladder, four fin-like limbs, and a long tail, all fitted for an aquatic life. As all the organic beings, extinct and recent, which have ever lived, can be arranged within a few great classes, and as all within each class have, according to our theory, been connected together by fine gradations, the best, and if our collections were nearly perfect, the only possible arrangement, would be genealogical. 
dissent being the hidden bond of connection which naturalists have been seeking under the term of the natural system. On this view, we can understand how it is that in the eyes of most naturalists the structure of the embryo is even more important for classification than that of the adult. In two or more groups of animals, however much they may differ from each other in structure and habits in their adult condition, if they pass through closely similar embryonic stages, we may feel assured that they are all descended from one parent form, and are therefore closely related. Thus, community in embryonic structure reveals community of descent, but dissimilarity in embryonic development does not prove discommunity of descent, for in one of two groups the developmental stages may have been suppressed, or may have been so greatly modified through adaptation to new habits of life as to be no longer recognizable. Even in groups in which the adults have been modified to an extreme degree, community of origin is often revealed by the structure of the larvae. We have seen, for instance, that cirripedes, although externally so like shellfish, are at once known by their larvae to belong to the great class of crustaceans. As the embryo often shows us more or less plainly the structure of the less modified and ancient progenitor of the group, we can see why ancient and extinct forms so often resemble in their adult state the embryos of existing species of the same class. Agassiz believes this to be a universal law of nature, and we may hope hereafter to see the law proved true. It can, however, be proved true only in those cases in which the ancient state of the progenitor of the group has not been wholly obliterated, either by successive variations having supervened at a very early period of growth, or by such variations having been inherited at an earlier age than that at which they first appeared. It should also be borne in mind that the law may be true but yet, owing to the geological record not extending far enough back in time, may remain for a long period, or for ever, incapable of demonstration. The law will not strictly hold good in those cases in which an ancient form became adapted in its larval state to some special line of life, and transmitted the same larval state to a whole group of descendants, for such larval state will not resemble any still more ancient form in its adult state. Thus, as it seems to me, the leading facts in embryology, which are second to none in importance, are explained on the principle of variations in the many descendants from some one ancient progenitor, having appeared at a not very early period of life, and having been inherited at a corresponding period. Embryology rises greatly in interest when we look at the embryo as a picture more or less obscured of the progenitor either in its adult or larval state of all the members of the same great class rudimentary atrophied and aborted organs organs or parts in this strange condition bearing the plain stamp of inutility are extremely common or even general throughout nature it would be impossible to name one of the higher animals in which some part or other is not in a rudimentary condition. In the mammalia, for instance, the males possess rudimentary mammae. In snakes, one lobe of the lungs is rudimentary. In birds, the bastard wing may safely be considered as a rudimentary digit, and in some species the whole wing is so far rudimentary that it cannot be used for flight. What can be more curious? than the presence of teeth in foetal whales, which, when grown up, have not a tooth in their heads, or the teeth, which never cut through the gums, in the upper jaws of unborn calves. Rudimentary organs plainly declare their origin and meaning in various ways. There are beetles belonging to closely allied species, or even to the same identical species, which have either full-sized and perfect wings, or mere rudiments of membrane, which not rarely lie under wing covers firmly soldered together, and in these cases it is impossible to doubt that the rudiments represent wings. Rudimentary organs sometimes retain their potentiality. This occasionally occurs with the mammae of male mammals, 
which have been known to become well developed and to secrete milk. So again in the udders of the genus Bos there are normally four developed and two rudimentary teats, but the latter in our domestic cows sometimes become well developed and yield milk. In regard to plants, the petals are sometimes rudimentary and sometimes well developed in the individuals of the same species. In certain plants having separated sexes, Kohlreuter found that by crossing a species in which the male flowers included a rudiment of a pistil, with an hermaphrodite species, having, of course, a well-developed pistil, the rudiment in the hybrid offspring was much increased in size, and this clearly shows that the rudimentary and perfect pistils are essentially alike in nature. An animal may possess various parts in a perfect state, and yet they may in one sense be rudimentary, for they are useless. Thus the tadpole of the common salamander or water newt, as Mr. G. H. Lewis remarks, has gills and passes its existence in the water, but the salamandra atra, which lives high up among the mountains, brings forth its young full-formed. This animal never lives in the water. Yet if we open a gravid female we find tadpoles inside her with exquisitely feathered gills, and when placed in water they swim about like the tadpoles of the water newt. Obviously this aquatic organization has no reference to the future life of the animal, nor has it any adaptation to its embryonic condition. It has solely reference to ancestral adaptations. It repeats a phase in the development of its progenitors. An organ serving for two purposes may become rudimentary or utterly aborted for one, even the more important purpose, and remain perfectly efficient for the other. Thus, in plants, the office of the pistil is to allow the pollen tube to reach the ovules within the ovarium. The pistil consists of the stigma supported on the style, but in some compositae, the male florets, which of course cannot be fecundated, have a rudimentary pistil, for it is not crowned with a stigma. But the style remains well developed and is clothed in the usual manner with hairs which serve to brush the pollen out of the surrounding and conjoined anthers. Again, an organ may become rudimentary for its proper purpose and be used for a distinct one. In certain fishes the swim-bladder seems to be rudimentary for its proper function of giving buoyancy, but has become converted into a nascent breathing organ, or lung. Many similar instances could be given. Useful organs, however little they may be developed, unless we have reason to suppose that they were formerly more highly developed, ought not to be considered as rudimentary. They may be in a nascent condition, and in progress towards further development. Rudimentary organs, on the other hand, are either quite useless, such as teeth which never cut through the gums, or almost useless, such as the wings of an ostrich, which serve merely as sails. As organs in this condition would formerly, when still less developed, have been of even less use than at present, they cannot formerly have been produced through variation and natural selection, which acts solely by the preservation of useful modifications. They have been partially retained by the power of inheritance, and relate to a former state of things. It is, however, often difficult to distinguish between rudimentary and nascent organs, for we can judge only by analogy whether a part is capable of further development, in which case alone it deserves to be called nascent. Organs in this condition will always be somewhat rare, for beings thus provided will commonly have been supplanted by their successors with the same organ in a more perfect state, and consequently will have become long ago extinct. The wing of the penguin is of high service, acting as a fin. It may therefore represent the nascent state of the wing, not that I believe this to be the case. It is more probably a reduced organ modified for a new function. The wing of the apteryx, on the other hand, is quite useless, and is truly rudimentary. Owen considers the simple filamentary limbs of the lepidosiren as the beginnings of organs which attain full functional development in higher vertebrates. But according to the view lately advocated by Dr. Gunther, they are probably remnants, consisting of the persistent axis of a fin, with the lateral rays or branches aborted. 
The mammary glands of the ornithorhynchus may be considered, in comparison with the others of a cow, as in a nascent condition. The ovigerous frena of certain cirripedes, which have ceased to give attachment to the ova, and are feebly developed, are nascent branchiae. Rudimentary organs in the individuals of the same species are very liable to vary in the degree of their development and in other respects. In closely allied species also, the extent to which the same organ has been reduced occasionally differs much. This latter fact is well exemplified in the state of the wings of female moths belonging to the same family. Rudimentary organs may be utterly aborted, and this implies that in certain animals or plants parts are entirely absent, which analogy would lead us to expect to find in them, and which are occasionally found in monstrous individuals. Thus in most of the Scrophulariaceae the fifth stamen is utterly aborted, yet we may conclude that a fifth stamen once existed, for a rudiment of it is found in many species of the family, and this rudiment occasionally becomes perfectly developed, as may sometimes be seen in the common snapdragon. In tracing the homologies of any part in different members of the same class, nothing is more common, or, in order fully to understand the relations of the parts, more useful than the discovery of rudiments. This is well shown in the drawings given by Owen of the leg-bones of the horse, ox, and rhinoceros. It is an important fact that rudimentary organs, such as teeth in the upper jaws of whales and ruminants, can often be detected in the embryo, but afterwards wholly disappear. It is also, I believe, a universal rule that a rudimentary part is of greater size in the embryo relatively to the adjoining parts than in the adult so that the organ at this early age is less rudimentary, or even cannot be said to be in any degree rudimentary. Hence rudimentary organs in the adult are often said to have retained their embryonic condition. I have now given the leading facts with respect to rudimentary organs. In reflecting on them, every one must be struck with astonishment, for the same reasoning power which tells us that most parts and organs are exquisitely adapted for certain purposes, tells us with equal plainness that these rudimentary or atrophied organs are imperfect and useless. In works on natural history, rudimentary organs are generally said to have been created for the sake of symmetry, or in order to complete the scheme of nature. But this is not an explanation, merely a restatement of the fact. Nor is it consistent with itself. Thus, the boa constrictor has rudiments of hind limbs and of a pelvis, and if it be said that these bones have been retained to complete the scheme of nature, why, as Professor Weissman asks, have they not been retained by other snakes which do not possess even a vestige of these same bones? What would be thought of an astronomer who maintained that the satellites revolve in elliptic courses round their planets, for the sake of symmetry, because the planets thus revolve round the sun? An eminent physiologist accounts for the presence of rudimentary organs by supposing that they serve to excrete matter in excess, or matter injurious to the system. But can we suppose that the minute papilla, which often represents the pistil in male flowers, and which is formed of mere cellular tissue, can thus act? Can we suppose that rudimentary teeth, which are subsequently absorbed, are beneficial to the rapidly growing embryonic calf by removing matter so precious as phosphate of lime? When a man's fingers have been amputated, imperfect nails have been known to appear on the stumps, and I could as soon believe that these vestiges of nails are developed in order to excrete horny matter, as that the rudimentary nails on the fin of the manatee have been developed for this same purpose. On the view of descent with modification, the origin of rudimentary organs is comparatively simple, and we can understand to a large extent the laws governing their imperfect development. We have plenty of cases of rudimentary organs in our domestic productions, as the stump of a tail in tailless breeds, the vestige of an ear in earless breeds of sheep, the reappearance of minute dangling horns in hornless breeds of cattle, more especially, according to Uat, in young animals, and the state 
of the whole flower in the cauliflower. We often see rudiments of various parts in monsters, but I doubt whether any of these cases throw light on the origin of rudimentary organs in a state of nature, further than by showing that rudiments can be produced. For the balance of evidence clearly indicates that species under nature do not undergo great and abrupt changes. But we learn from the study of our domestic productions that the disuse of parts leads to their reduced size, and that the result is inherited. It appears probable that disuse has been the main agent in rendering organs rudimentary. It would at first lead by slow steps to the more and more complete reduction of a part, until at last it became rudimentary, as in the case of the eyes of animals inhabiting dark caverns, and of the wings of birds inhabiting oceanic islands, which have seldom been forced by beasts of prey to take flight, and have ultimately lost the power of flying. Again, an organ useful under certain conditions might become injurious under others, as with the wings of beetles living on small and exposed islands, and in this case natural selection will have aided in reducing the organ until it was rendered harmless and rudimentary. Any change in structure and function which can be effected by small stages is within the power of natural selection, so that an organ rendered through changed habits of life useless or injurious for one purpose might be modified and used for another purpose. An organ might also be retained for one alone of its former functions. Organs, originally formed by the aid of natural selection, when rendered useless, may well be variable, for their variations can no longer be checked by natural selection. All this agrees well with what we see under nature. Moreover, at whatever period of life either disuse or selection reduces an organ, and this will generally be when the being has come to maturity, and to exert its full powers of action, the principle of inheritance at corresponding ages will tend to reproduce the organ in its reduced state at the same mature age, but will seldom affect it in the embryo. Thus we can understand the greater size of rudimentary organs in the embryo relatively to the adjoining parts, and their lesser relative size in the adult. If, for instance, the digit of an adult animal was used less and less during many generations, owing to some change of habits, or if an organ or gland was less and less functionally exercised, we may infer that it would become reduced in size in the adult descendants of this animal, but would retain nearly its original standard of development in the embryo. There remains, however, this difficulty. After an organ has ceased being used, and has become, in consequence, much reduced, how can it be still further reduced in size, until the merest vestige is left, and how can it be finally quite obliterated? It is scarcely possible that disuse can go on producing any further effect after the organ has once been rendered functionless. Some additional explanation is here requisite which I cannot give. If, for instance, it could be proved that every part of the organization tends to vary in a greater degree towards diminution than towards augmentation of size, then we should be able to understand how an organ which has become useless would be rendered, independently of the effects of disuse, rudimentary, and would at last be wholly suppressed, for the variations towards diminished size would no longer be checked by natural selection. The principle of the economy of growth, explained in a former chapter, by which the materials forming any part, if not useful to the possessor, are saved as far as is possible, will perhaps come into play, in rendering a useless part rudimentary, but this principle will almost necessarily be confined to the earlier stages of the process of reduction, for we cannot suppose that a minute papilla, for example, representing in a male flower the pistil of the female flower, and formed merely of cellular tissue, could be further reduced or absorbed for the sake of economizing nutriment. Finally, as rudimentary organs, by whatever steps they may have been degraded into their present useless condition, are the record of a former state of things, and have been retained solely through the power of inheritance, 
we can understand on the genealogical view of classification how it is that systematists in placing organisms in their proper places in the natural system have often found rudimentary parts as useful as or even sometimes more useful than parts of high physiological importance rudimentary organs may be compared with the letters in a word still retained in the spelling but become useless in the pronunciation but which serve as a clue for its derivation on the view of descent with modification we may conclude that the existence of organs in a rudimentary imperfect and useless condition or quite aborted far from presenting a strange difficulty as they assuredly do on the old doctrine of creation might even have been anticipated in accordance with the views here explained summary in this chapter i have attempted to show that the arrangement of all organic beings throughout all time in groups under groups that the nature of the relationships by which all living and extinct organisms are united by complex radiating and circuitous lines of affinities into a few grand classes the rules followed and the difficulties encountered by naturalists in their classifications the value set upon characters if constant and prevalent whether of high or of the most trifling importance or as with rudimentary organs of no importance the wide opposition in value between analogical or adaptive characters and characters of true affinity and other such rules all naturally follow if we admit the common parentage of allied forms together with their modification through variation and natural selection with the continuances of extinction and divergence of character in considering this view of classification it should be borne in mind that the element of descent has been universally used in ranking together the sexes ages dimorphic forms and acknowledged varieties of the same species however much they may differ from each other in structure if we extend the use of this element of descent the one certainly known cause of similarity in organic beings we shall understand what is meant by the natural system it is genealogical in its attempted arrangement with the grades of acquired difference marked by the terms varieties species genera families orders and classes on this same view of descent with modification most of the great facts in morphology become intelligible whether we look to the same pattern displayed by the different species of the same class in their homologous organs to whatever purpose applied or to the serial and lateral homologies in each individual animal and plant on the principle of successive slight variations not necessarily or generally supervening at a very early period of life and being inherited at a corresponding period we can understand the leading facts in embryology namely the close resemblance in the individual embryo of the parts which are homologous and which when matured become widely different in structure and function and the resemblance of the homologous parts or organs in allied though distinct species though fitted in the adult state for habits as different as is possible larvae are active embryos which have become specially modified in a greater or less degree in relation to their habits of life with their modifications inherited at a corresponding early age on these same principles and bearing in mind that when organs are reduced in size either from disuse or through natural selection it will generally be at that period of life when the being has to provide for its own wants and bearing in mind how strong is the force of inheritance the occurrence of rudimentary organs might even have been anticipated the importance of embryological characters and of rudimentary organs in classification is intelligible on the view that a natural arrangement must be genealogical finally the several classes of facts which have been considered in this chapter seem to me to proclaim so plainly that the innumerable species genera and families with which this world is peopled are all descended each within its own class or group from common parents and have all been modified in the course of descent that i should without hesitation adopt this view even if it were unsupported by other facts or arguments. End of chapter 14 In the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin 
This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com. March 2006. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter 15. Recapitulation and Conclusion. Contents of this chapter include Recapitulation of the Objections to the Theory of Natural Selection Recapitulation of the General and Special Circumstances in its Favor Causes of the General Belief in the Immutability of Species How Far the Theory of Natural Selection May Be Extended Effects of Its Adoption on the Study of Natural History Concluding Remarks Recapitulation of the Objections to the Theory of Natural Selection As this whole volume is one long argument, it may be convenient to the reader to have the leading facts and inferences briefly recapitulated. That many and serious objections may be advanced against the theory of descent with modification through variation and natural selection, I do not deny. I have endeavored to give to them their full force. Nothing at first can appear more difficult to believe than that the more complex organs and instincts have been perfected, not by means superior to, though analogous with, human reason, but by the accumulation of innumerable slight variations, each good for the individual possessor. Nevertheless, this difficulty, though appearing to our imagination insuperably great, cannot be considered real if we admit the following propositions namely, that all parts of the organization and instincts offer, at least individual differences, that there is a struggle for existence leading to the preservation of profitable deviations of structure or instinct, and, lastly, that gradations in the state of perfection of each organ may have existed, each good of its kind. The truth of these propositions cannot, I think, be disputed. It is no doubt extremely difficult even to conjecture by what gradations many structures have been perfected, more especially among broken and failing groups of organic beings which have suffered much extinction, but we see so many strange gradations in nature that we ought to be extremely cautious in saying that any organ or instinct or any whole structure could not have arrived at its present state by many graduated steps. There are, it must be admitted, cases of special difficulty opposed to the theory of natural selection, and one of the most curious of these is the existence in the same community of two or three defined castes of workers or sterile female ants, but I have attempted to show how these difficulties can be mastered. With respect to the almost universal sterility of species when first crossed, which forms so remarkable a contrast with the almost universal fertility of varieties when crossed, I must refer the reader to the recapitulation of the facts given at the end of the ninth chapter, which seem to me conclusively to show that this sterility is no more a special endowment than is the incapacity of two distinct kinds of trees to be grafted together. But that it is incidental on differences confined to the reproductive systems of the intercross species. We see the truth of this conclusion in the vast difference in the results of crossing the same two species reciprocally. That is, when one species is first used as the father and then as the mother. Analogy from the consideration of dimorphic and trimorphic plants clearly leads to the same conclusion. For when the forms are illegitimately united, they yield few or no seed, and their offspring are more or less sterile, and these forms belong to the same undoubted species, and differ from each other in no respect, except in their reproductive organs and functions. 
Although the fertility of varieties when intercrossed, and of their mongrel offspring, has been asserted by so many authors to be universal, this cannot be considered as quite correct after the facts given on the high authority of Gartner and Kohlreuter. Most of the varieties which have been experimented on have been produced under domestication, and as domestication, I do not mean mere confinement, almost certainly tends to eliminate that sterility which, judging from analogy, would have affected the parent species if intercrossed. We ought not to expect that domestication would likewise induce sterility in their modified descendants when crossed. This elimination of sterility apparently follows from the same cause which allows our domestic animals to breed freely under diversified circumstances, and this again apparently follows from their having been gradually accustomed to frequent changes in their conditions of life. A double and parallel series of facts seems to throw much light on the sterility of species when first crossed, and of their hybrid offspring. On the one side there is good reason to believe that slight changes in the conditions of life give vigor and fertility to all organic beings. We know also that a cross between the distinct individuals of the same variety, and between distinct varieties, increases the number of their offspring, and certainly gives to them increased size and vigor. This is chiefly owing to the forms which are crossed having been exposed to somewhat different conditions of life. For I have ascertained by a laborious series of experiments that if all the individuals of the same variety be subjected during several generations to the same conditions, the good derived from crossing is often much diminished or wholly disappears. This is one side of the case. On the other side, we know that species which have long been exposed to nearly uniform conditions, when they are subjected under confinement to new and greatly changed conditions, either perish, or if they survive, are rendered sterile, though retaining perfect health. This does not occur, or only in a very slight degree, with our domesticated productions, which have long been exposed to fluctuating conditions. Hence, when we find that hybrids produced by a cross between two distinct species are few in number, owing to their perishing soon after conception, or at a very early age, or if surviving that they are rendered more or less sterile, it seems highly probable that this result is due to their having been in fact subjected to a great change in their conditions of life, from being compounded of two distinct organizations. He who will explain in a definite manner why, for instance, an elephant or a fox will not breed under confinement in its native country, whilst the domestic pig or dog will breed freely under the most diversified conditions, will at the same time be able to give a definite answer to the question why two distinct species, when crossed, as well as their hybrid offspring, are generally rendered more or less sterile while two domesticated varieties, when crossed, and their mongrel offspring, are perfectly fertile. Turning to geographical distribution, the difficulties encountered on the theory of descent with modification are serious enough. All the individuals of the same species, and all the species of the same genus, or even higher group, are descended from common parents, and therefore, in however distant and isolated parts of the world they may now be found, they must, in the course of successive generations, have traveled from some one point to all the others. We are often wholly unable even to conjecture how this could have been effected. Yet, as we have reason to believe that some species have retained the same specific form for very long periods of time, immensely long as measured by years, too much stress ought not to be laid on the occasional wide diffusion of the same species. For during very long periods there will always have been a good chance for wide migration by many means. A broken or interrupted range may often be accounted for by the extinction of the species in the intermediate regions. It cannot be denied that we are as yet very ignorant as to the full extent of the various climatical and geographical changes which have affected the earth during modern periods, 
and such changes will often have facilitated migration. As an example, I have attempted to show how potent has been the influence of the glacial period on the distribution of the same and of allied species throughout the world. We are as yet profoundly ignorant of the many occasional means of transport. With respect to distinct species of the same genus, inhabiting distant and isolated regions, as the process of modification has necessarily been slow, all the means of migration will have been possible during a very long period, and consequently the difficulty of the wide diffusion of the species of the same genus is in some degree lessened. As according to the theory of natural selection, an interminable number of intermediate forms must have existed, linking together all the species in each group by gradations as fine as our existing varieties. It may be asked, why do we not see these linking forms all around us? Why are not all organic beings blended together in an inextricable chaos? With respect to existing forms, we should remember that we have no right to expect, excepting in rare cases, to discover directly connecting links between them, but only between each and some extinct and supplanted form. Even on a wide area, which has, during a long period, remained continuous, and of which the climatic and other conditions of life change insensibly in proceeding from a district occupied by one species into another district occupied by a closely allied species, we have no just right to expect often to find intermediate varieties in the intermediate zones. For we have reason to believe that only a few species of a genus ever undergo change the other species becoming utterly extinct and leaving no modified progeny. Of the species which do change, only a few within the same country change at the same time, and all modifications are slowly effected. I have also shown that the intermediate varieties which probably at first existed in the intermediate zones would be liable to be supplanted by the allied forms on either hand for the latter, from existing in greater numbers, would generally be modified and improved at a quicker rate than the intermediate varieties which existed in lesser numbers, so that the intermediate varieties would, in the long run, be supplanted and exterminated. On this doctrine of the extermination of an infinitude of connecting links between the living and extinct inhabitants of the world, and at each successive period between the extinct and still older species, why is not every geological formation charged with such links? Why does not every collection of fossil remains afford plain evidence of the gradation and mutation of the forms of life? Although geological research has undoubtedly revealed the former existence of many links, bringing numerous forms of life much closer together, it does not yield the infinitely many fine gradations between past and present species required on the theory. And this is the most obvious of the many objections which may be urged against it. Why, again, do whole groups of allied species appear, though this appearance is often false, to have come in suddenly on the successive geological stages? Although we now know that organic beings appeared on this globe at a period incalculably remote, long before the lowest bed of the Cambrian system was deposited, why do we not find beneath this system great piles of strata stored with the remains of the progenitors of the Cambrian fossils? For on the theory, such strata must somewhere have been deposited at these ancient and utterly unknown epochs of the world's history. I can answer these questions and objections only on the supposition that the geological record is far more imperfect than most geologists believe. The number of specimens in all our museums is absolutely as nothing compared with the countless generations of countless species which have certainly existed. The parent form of any two or more species would not be in all its characters directly intermediate between its modified offspring, any more than the rock pigeon is directly intermediate in crop and tail between its descendants, the powder and fantail pigeons. We should not be able to recognize a species as the parent of another 
and modified species, if we were to examine the two ever so closely, unless we possessed most of the intermediate links, and owing to the imperfection of the geological record, we have no just right to expect to find so many links. If two or three or even more linking forms were discovered, they would simply be ranked by many naturalists as so many new species, more especially if found in different geological substages, let their differences be ever so slight. Numerous existing doubtful forms could be named which are probably varieties, but who will pretend that in future ages so many fossil links will be discovered that naturalists will be able to decide whether or not these doubtful forms are to be called varieties? Only a small portion of the world has been geologically explored. Only organic beings of certain classes can be preserved in a fossil condition, at least in any great number. Many species, when once formed, never undergo any further change, but become extinct without leaving modified descendants, and the periods during which species have undergone modification, though long is measured by years, have probably been short in comparison with the periods during which they retain the same form. It is the dominant and widely ranging species which vary most frequently and vary most, and varieties are often at first local, both causes rendering the discovery of intermediate links in any one formation less likely. Local varieties will not spread into other and distant regions until they are considerably modified and improved, and when they have spread and are discovered in a geological formation, they appear as if suddenly created there and will be simply classed as new species. Most formations have been intermittent in their accumulation, and their duration has probably been shorter than the average duration of specific forms. Successive formations are in most cases separated from each other by blank intervals of time of great length, for fossiliferous formations, thick enough to resist future degradation, can, as a general rule, be accumulated only where much sediment is deposited on the subsiding bed of the sea. During the alternate periods of elevation and of stationary level, the record will generally be blank. During these latter periods, there will probably be more variability in the forms of life during periods of subsidence, more extinction. With respect to the absence of strata rich in fossils between the Cambrian formation, I can recur only to the hypothesis given in the tenth chapter, namely, that though our continents and oceans have endured for an enormous period in nearly their present relative positions, we have no reason to assume that this has always been the case. Consequently, formations much older than any now known may lie buried beneath the great oceans. With respect to the lapse of time not having been sufficient since our planet was consolidated for the assumed amount of organic change, and this objection, as urged by Sir William Thompson, is probably one of the gravest as yet advanced, I can only say, firstly, that we do not know at what rate species change, as measured by years, and secondly, that many philosophers are not as yet willing to admit that we know enough of the constitution of the universe and of the interior of our globe to speculate with safety on its past duration. That the geological record is imperfect, all will admit, but that it is imperfect to the degree required by our theory, few will be inclined to admit. If we look to long enough intervals of time, geology plainly declares that species have all changed, and they have changed in the manner required by the theory, for they have changed slowly and in a graduated manner. We clearly see this in the fossil remains from consecutive formations invariably being much more closely related to each other than are the fossils from widely separated formations. Such is the sum of the several chief objections and difficulties which may justly be urged against the theory, and I have now briefly recapitulated the answers and explanations which, as far as I can see, may be given 
I have felt these difficulties far too heavily during many years to doubt their weight, but it deserves especial notice that the more important objections relate to questions on which we are confessedly ignorant, nor do we know how ignorant we are. We do not know all the possible transitional gradations between the simplest and the most perfect organs. It cannot be pretended that we know all the varied means of distribution during the long lapse of years, or that we know how imperfect is the geological record. Serious as these several objections are, in my judgment, they are by no means sufficient to overthrow the theory of descent with subsequent modification. Now let us turn to the other side of the argument. Under domestication we see much variability, caused, or at least excited, by changed conditions of life, but often in so obscure a manner that we are tempted to consider the variations as spontaneous. Variability is governed by many complex laws, by correlated growth, compensation, the increased use and disuse of parts, and the definite action of the surrounding conditions. There is much difficulty in ascertaining how largely our domestic productions have been modified, but we may safely infer that the amount has been large, and that modifications can be inherited for long periods. As long as the conditions of life remain the same, we have reason to believe that a modification, which has already been inherited for many generations, may continue to be inherited for an almost infinite number of generations. On the other hand, we have evidence that variability, when it has once come into play, does not cease under domestication for a very long period, nor do we know that it ever ceases for new varieties are still occasionally produced by our oldest domesticated productions. Variability is not actually caused by man. He only unintentionally exposes organic beings to new conditions of life, and then nature acts on the organization and causes it to vary. But man can and does select the variations given to him by nature, and thus accumulates them in any desired manner. He thus adapts animals and plants for his own benefit or pleasure. He may do this methodically, or he may do it unconsciously by preserving the individuals most useful or pleasing to him, without any intention of altering the breed. It is certain that he can largely influence the character of a breed by selecting in each successive generation individual differences so slight as to be inappreciable except by an educated eye. This unconscious process of selection has been the great agency in the formation of the most distinct and useful domestic breeds. That many breeds produced by man have to a large extent the character of natural species is shown by the inextricable doubts whether many of them are varieties or aboriginally distinct species. There is no reason why the principles which have acted so efficiently under domestication, should not have acted under nature. In the survival of favored individuals and races, during the constantly recurrent struggle for existence, we see a powerful and ever-acting form of selection. The struggle for existence inevitably follows from the high geometrical ratio of increase, which is common to all organic beings. This high rate of increase is proved by calculation by the rapid increase of many animals and plants during a succession of peculiar seasons and when naturalized in new countries. More individuals are born than can possibly survive. A grain in the balance may determine which individual shall live and which shall die, which variety or species shall increase in number and which shall decrease or finally become extinct. As the individuals of the same species come in all respects into the closest competition with each other, the struggle will generally be most severe between them. It will be almost equally severe between the varieties of the same species, and next in severity between the species of the same genus. On the other hand, the struggle will often be severe between beings remote in the scale of nature. The slightest advantage in certain individuals 
at any age or during any season over those with which they come into competition or better adaptation in however slight a degree to the surrounding physical conditions will in the long run turn the balance with animals having separated sexes there will be in most cases a struggle between the males for the possession of the females the most vigorous males or those which have most successfully struggled with their conditions of life will generally leave most progeny but success will often depend on the males having special weapons or means of defence or charms and a slight advantage will lead to victory as geology plainly proclaims that each land has undergone great physical changes we might have expected to find that organic beings have varied under nature in the same way as they have varied under domestication and if there has been any variability under nature it would be an unaccountable fact if natural selection had not come into play it has often been asserted but the assertion is incapable of proof that the amount of variation under nature is a strictly limited quantity man though acting on external characters alone and often capriciously can produce within a short period a great result by adding up mere individual differences in his domestic productions and every one admits that species present individual differences but besides such differences all naturalists admit that natural varieties exist which are considered sufficiently distinct to be worthy of record in systematic works no one has drawn any clear distinction between individual differences and slight varieties or between more plainly marked varieties and subspecies and species on separate continents and on different parts of the same continent when divided by barriers of any kind and on outlying islands what a multitude of forms exist which some experienced naturalists rank as varieties others as geographical races or subspecies and others as distinct though closely allied species if then animals and plants do vary let it be ever so slightly or slowly why should not variations or individual differences, which are in any way beneficial, be preserved and accumulated through natural selection, or the survival of the fittest? If man can by patience select variations useful to him, why, under changing and complex conditions of life, should not variations useful to nature's living products often arise, and be preserved or selected? what limit can be put to this power acting during long ages and rigidly scrutinizing the whole constitution structure and habits of each creature favoring the good and rejecting the bad i can see no limit to this power in slowly and beautifully adapting each form to the most complex relations of life the theory of natural selection even if we look no further than this seems to be in the highest degree probable i have already recapitulated as fairly as i could the opposed difficulties and objections now let us turn to the special facts and arguments in favor of the theory recapitulation of the general and special circumstances in its favor on the view that species are only strongly marked and permanent varieties and that each species first existed as a variety we can see why it is that no line of demarcation can be drawn between species commonly supposed to have been produced by special acts of creation and varieties which are acknowledged to have been produced by secondary laws on this same view we can understand how it is that in a region where many species of a genus have been produced and where they now flourish, these same species should present many varieties. For where the manufactory of species has been active, we might expect, as a general rule, to find it still in action, and this is the case if varieties be incipient species. Moreover, the species of the larger genera, which afford the greater number of varieties or incipient species, retain to a certain degree the character of varieties for they differ from each other by a less amount of difference than do the species of smaller genera the closely allied species also of a larger genera apparently have restricted ranges and in their affinities they are clustered in little groups round other species in both respects resembling varieties these are strange relations on the view that each species was independently created but are intelligible if each existed first as a variety 
As each species tends by its geometrical rate of reproduction to increase inordinately in number, and as the modified descendants of each species will be enabled to increase by as much as they become more diversified in habits and structure, so as to be able to seize on many and widely different places in the economy of nature, there will be a constant tendency in natural selection to preserve the most divergent offspring of any one species. Hence, during a long continued course of modification, the slight differences characteristic of varieties of the same species tend to be augmented into the greater differences characteristic of the species of the same genus. New and improved varieties will inevitably supplant and exterminate the older, less improved and intermediate varieties, and thus species are rendered to a large extent defined and distinct objects. Dominant species belonging to the larger groups within each class tend to give birth to new and dominant forms, so that each large group tends to become still larger, and at the same time more divergent in character. But as all groups cannot thus go on increasing in size, for the world would not hold them, the more dominant groups beat the less dominant. This tendency in the large groups to go on increasing in size and diverging in character, together with the inevitable contingency of much extinction, explains the arrangement of all the forms of life in groups subordinate to groups, all within a few great classes, which has prevailed throughout all time. This grand fact of the grouping of all organic beings under what is called the natural system is utterly inexplicable on the theory of creation. As natural selection acts solely by accumulating slight, successive, favorable variations, it can produce no great or sudden modifications. It can act only by short and slow steps. Hence the canon of natura non facit saltum, which every fresh addition to our knowledge tends to confirm, is on this theory intelligible. We can see why throughout nature the same general end is gained by an almost infinite diversity of means, for every peculiarity, when once acquired, is long inherited, and structures already modified in many different ways have to be adapted for the same general purpose. We can, in short, see why nature is prodigal in variety, though niggard in innovation, but why this should be a law of nature, if each species has been independently created, no man can explain. Many other facts are, as it seems to me, explicable on this theory. How strange it is that a bird, under the form of a woodpecker, should prey on insects on the ground, that upland geese, which rarely or never swim, would possess webbed feet that a thrush-like bird should dive and feed on subaquatic insects, and that a petrel should have the habits and structure fitting it for the life of an auk, and so in endless other cases. But on the view of each species constantly trying to increase in number, with natural selection always ready to adapt the slowly varying descendants of each to any unoccupied or ill-occupied place in nature, these facts cease to be strange, or might even have been anticipated. We can, to a certain extent, understand how it is that there is so much beauty throughout nature, for this may be largely attributed to the agency of selection. That beauty, according to our sense of it, is not universal, must be admitted by every one who will look at some venomous snakes, at some fishes, and at certain hideous bats with a distorted resemblance to the human face. Sexual selection has given the most brilliant colors, elegant patterns, and other ornaments to the males, and sometimes to both sexes of many birds, butterflies, and other animals. With birds it has often rendered the voice of the male musical to the female, as well as to our ears. Flowers and fruit 
have been rendered conspicuous by brilliant colors in contrast with the green foliage, in order that the flowers may be easily seen, visited and fertilized by insects, and the seeds disseminated by birds. How it comes that certain colors, sounds, and forms should give pleasure to man and the lower animals, that is, how the sense of beauty in its simplest form was first acquired, we do not know any more than how certain odors and flavors were first rendered agreeable. As natural selection acts by competition, it adapts and improves the inhabitants of each country only in relation to their co-inhabitants, so that we need feel no surprise at the species of any one country, although, on the ordinary view, supposed to have been created and specially adapted for that country, being beaten and supplanted by the naturalized productions from another land. Nor ought we to marvel if all the contrivances in nature be not, as far as we can judge, absolutely perfect as in the case even of the human eye, or if some of them be abhorrent to our ideas of fitness, we need not marvel at the sting of the bee when used against the enemy, causing the bee's own death, at drones being produced in such great numbers for one single act, and being then slaughtered by their sterile sisters, at the astonishing waste of pollen by our fir trees, at the instinctive hatred of the queen bee for her own fertile daughters, at ichnomonidae feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, and at other such cases, the wonder, indeed, is on the theory of natural selection, that more cases of the want of absolute perfection have not been detected. The complex and little-known laws governing the production of varieties are the same, as far as we can judge, with the laws which have governed the production of distinct species. In both cases, physical conditions seem to have produced some direct and definite effect. But how much we cannot say. Thus, when varieties enter any new station, they occasionally assume some of the characters proper to the species of that station. With both varieties and species, use and disuse seem to have produced a considerable effect, for it is impossible to resist this conclusion when we look, for instance, at the logger-headed duck, which has wings incapable of flight, in nearly the same condition as in the domestic duck, or when we look at the burrowing tuku tuku, which is occasionally blind, and then at certain moles, which are habitually blind, and have their eyes covered with skin, or when we look at the blind animals inhabiting the dark caves of America and Europe. With varieties and species, correlated variation seems to have played an important part, so that when one part has been modified, other parts have been necessarily modified. With both varieties and species, reversions to long-lost characters occasionally occur. How inexplicable on the theory of creation is the occasional appearance of stripes on the shoulders and legs of the several species of the horse genus and of their hybrids. How simply is this fact explained if we believe that these species are all descended from a striped progenitor in the same manner as the several domestic breeds of the pigeon are descended from the blue and barred rock pigeon. On the ordinary view of each species having been independently created, why should specific characters, or those by which the species of the same genus differ from each other, be more variable than the generic characters in which they all agree? Why, for instance, should the color of a flower be more likely to vary in any one species of a genus if the other species possess differently colored flowers? than if all possessed the same colored flowers. If species are only well-marked varieties, of which the characters have become in a high degree permanent, we can understand this fact, for they have already varied since they branched off from a common progenitor in certain characters, by which they have come to be specifically distinct from each other. Therefore these same characters would be more likely again 
to vary than the generic characters which have been inherited without change for an immense period. It is inexplicable on the theory of creation why a part developed in a very unusual manner in one species alone of a genus, and therefore, as we may naturally infer, of great importance to that species, should be eminently liable to variation. But on our view, this part has undergone, since the several species branched off from a common progenitor, an unusual amount of variability and modification, and therefore we might expect the part generally to be still variable. But a part may be developed in the most unusual manner, like the wing of a bat, and yet not be more variable than any other structure, if the part be common to many subordinate forms, that is, if it has been inherited for a very long period. For in this case, it will have been rendered constant by long-continued natural selection. Glancing at instincts, marvelous as some are, they offer no greater difficulty than do corporeal structures on the theory of the natural selection of successive, slight, but profitable modifications. We can thus understand why nature moves by graduated steps in endowing different animals of the same class with their several instincts. I have attempted to show how much light the principle of gradation throws on the admirable architectural powers of the hive bee. Habit, no doubt, often comes into play in modifying instincts, but it certainly is not indispensable. As we see in the case of neuter insects, which leave no progeny to inherit the effects of long-continued habit. On the view of all the species of the same genus, having descended from a common parent, and having inherited much in common, we can understand how it is that allied species, when placed under widely different conditions of life, yet follow nearly the same instincts, why the thrushes of tropical and temperate South America, for instance, line their nests with mud like our British species. On the view of instincts, having been slowly acquired through natural selection, we need not marvel at some instincts being not perfect and liable to mistakes, and at many instincts causing other animals to suffer. If species be only well-marked and permanent varieties, we can at once see why their crossed offspring should follow the same complex laws in their degrees and kinds of resemblance to their parents, in being absorbed into each other by successive crosses and in other such points, as do the crossed offspring of acknowledged varieties. This similarity would be a strange fact if species had been independently created and varieties had been produced through secondary laws. If we admit that the geological record is imperfect to an extreme degree, then the facts, which the record does give, strongly support the theory of descent with modification. New species have come on the stage slowly and at successive intervals, and the amount of change after equal intervals of time is widely different in different groups. The extinction of species, and of whole groups of species, which has played so conspicuous a part in the history of the organic world, almost inevitably follows from the principle of natural selection, for old forms are supplanted by new and improved forms. Neither single species nor groups of species reappear when the chain of ordinary generation is once broken. The gradual diffusion of dominant forms, with the slow modification of their descendants, causes the forms of life, after long intervals of time, to appear as if they had changed simultaneously throughout the world. The fact of the fossil remains of each formation being in some degree intermediate in character between the fossils in the formations above and below, is simply explained by their intermediate position in the chain of descent. The grand fact that all extinct beings can be classed with all recent beings naturally follows from the living and the extinct being the offspring of common parents. 
As species have generally diverged in character during their long course of descent and modification, we can understand why it is that the more ancient forms, or early progenitors of each group, so often occupy a position in some degree intermediate between existing groups. Recent forms are generally looked upon as being, on the whole, higher in the scale of organization than ancient forms, and they must be higher in so far as the later and more improved forms have conquered the older and less improved forms in the struggle for life. They have also generally had their organs more specialized for different functions. This fact is perfectly compatible with numerous beings still retaining simple and but little improved structures fitted for simple conditions of life. It is likewise compatible with some forms having retrograded in organization by having become at each stage of descent better fitted for new and degraded habits of life. Lastly, the wonderful law of the long endurance of allied forms on the same continent, of marsupials in Australia, of edentata in America, and other such cases, is intelligible. For within the same country, the existing and the extinct will be closely allied by descent. Looking to geographical distribution, if we admit that there has been, during the long course of ages, much migration from one part of the world to another, owing to former climatical and geographical changes, and to the many occasional and unknown means of dispersal, then we can understand, on the theory of descent with modification, most of the great leading facts in distribution. We can see why there should be so striking a parallelism in the distribution of organic beings throughout space, and in their geological succession throughout time, for in both cases the beings have been connected by the bond of ordinary generation, and the means of modification have been the same. We see the full meaning of the wonderful fact which has struck every traveler, namely, that on the same continent, under the most diverse conditions, under heat and cold, on mountain and lowland, on deserts and marshes, most of the inhabitants within each great class are plainly related, for they are the descendants of the same progenitors and early colonists. On this same principle of former migration, combined in most cases with modification, we can understand by the aid of the glacial period, the identity of some few plants, and the close alliance of many others, on the most distant mountains, and in the northern and southern temperate zones, and likewise the close alliance of some of the inhabitants of the sea in the northern and southern temperate latitudes, though separated by the whole intertropical ocean. Although two countries may present physical conditions as closely similar as the same species ever require, we need feel no surprise at their inhabitants being widely different, if they have been for a long period completely sundered from each other, for as the relation of organism to organism is the most important of all relations, and as the two countries will have received colonists at various periods, and in different proportions, from some other country or from each other, the course of modification in the two areas will inevitably have been different. On this view of migration with subsequent modification, we see why oceanic islands are inhabited by only few species, but of these, why many are peculiar or endemic forms. We clearly see why species belonging to those groups of animals which cannot cross wide spaces of the ocean, as frogs and terrestrial mammals, do not inhabit oceanic islands, and why, on the other hand, new and peculiar species of bats, animals which can traverse the ocean, are often found on islands far distant from any continent. Such cases as the presence of peculiar species of bats on oceanic islands and the absence of all other terrestrial mammals are facts utterly inexplicable on the theory of independent acts of creation. 
The existence of closely allied representative species in any two areas implies, on the theory of descent with modification, that the same parent forms formerly inhabited both areas, and we almost invariably find that wherever many closely allied species inhabit two areas, some identical species are still common to both. Wherever many closely allied yet distinct species occur, doubtful forms and varieties belonging to the same groups likewise occur. It is a rule of high generality that the inhabitants of each area are related to the inhabitants of the nearest source whence immigrants might have been derived. We see this in the striking relation of nearly all the plants and animals of the Galapagos archipelago, of Juan Fernandez, and of the other American islands, to the plants and animals of the neighboring American mainland, and of those of the Cape de Verde archipelago, and of the other African islands to the African mainland. It must be admitted that these facts receive no explanation on the theory of creation. The fact, as we have seen, that all past and present organic beings can be arranged within a few great classes, in groups subordinate to groups, and with the extinct groups often falling in between the recent groups, is intelligible on the theory of natural selection with its contingencies of extinction and divergence of character. On these same principles we see how it is that the mutual affinities of the forms within each class are so complex and circuitous. We see why certain characters are far more serviceable than others for classification, why adaptive characters, though of paramount importance to the beings, are of hardly any importance in classification, why characters derived from rudimentary parts, though of no service to the beings, are often of high classificatory value, and why embryological characters are often the most valuable of all. The real affinities of all organic beings, in contradistinction to their adaptive resemblances, are due to inheritance or community of descent. The natural system is a genealogical arrangement with the acquired grades of difference, marked by the terms varieties, species, genera, families, etc., and we have to discover the lines of descent by the most permanent characters, whatever they may be, and of however slight vital importance. The similar framework of bones in the hand of man, wing of a bat, fin of the porpoise, and leg of the horse, the same number of vertebrae forming the neck of the giraffe and of the elephant, and innumerable other such facts, at once explain themselves on the theory of descent with slow and slight successive modifications. The similarity of pattern in the wing and in the leg of a bat, though used for such different purpose, in the jaws and legs of a crab, in the petals, stamens, and pistils of a flower, is likewise, to a large extent, intelligible on the view of the gradual modification of parts or organs, which were aboriginally alike, in an early progenitor in each of these classes, on the principle of successive variations, not always supervening at an early age, and being inherited at a corresponding not early period of life, we clearly see why the embryos of mammals, birds, reptiles, and fishes should be so closely similar and so unlike the adult forms, we may cease marveling at the embryo of an air-breathing mammal or bird having brain-keel slits and arteries running in loops, like those of a fish, which has to breathe the air dissolved in water by the aid of well-developed brain-keel. Disuse, aided sometimes by natural selection, will often have reduced organs when rendered useless under changed habits or conditions of life. And we can understand on this view the meaning of rudimentary organs. But disuse and selection will generally act on each creature, when it has come to maturity, 
and has to play its full part in the struggle for existence, and will thus have little power on an organ during early life, hence the organ will not be reduced or rendered rudimentary at this early age. The cat, for instance, has inherited teeth which never cut through the gums of the upper jaw from an early progenitor having well-developed teeth, and we may believe that the teeth in the mature animal were formerly reduced by disuse owing to the tongue and palate, or lips, having become excellently fitted through natural selection to browse without their aid, whereas in the calf the teeth have been left unaffected, and on the principle of inheritance at corresponding ages, have been inherited from a remote period to the present day. On the view of each organism with all its separate parts having been specially created, how utterly inexplicable is it that organs bearing the plain stamp of inutility, such as the teeth in the embryonic calf, or the shriveled wings under the soldered wing covers of many beetles, should so frequently occur. Nature may be said to have taken pains to reveal her scheme of modification by means of rudimentary organs of embryological and homologous structures, but we are too blind to understand her meaning. I have now recapitulated the facts and considerations which have thoroughly convinced me that species have been modified during a long course of descent. This has been effected chiefly through the natural selection of numerous, successive, slight, favorable variations, aided in an important manner by the inherited effects of the use and disuse of parts, and in an unimportant manner, that is, in relation to adaptive structures, whether past or present, by the direct action of external conditions, and by variations which seem to us in our ignorance to arise spontaneously. It appears that I formerly underrated the frequency and value of these latter forms of variation as leading to permanent modifications of structure independently of natural selection. But as my conclusions have lately been much misrepresented, and it has been stated that I attribute the modification of species exclusively to natural selection, I may be permitted to remark that in the first edition of this work, and subsequently i placed in a most conspicuous position namely at the close of the introduction the following words i am convinced that natural selection has been the main but not the exclusive means of modification this has been of no avail great is the power of steady misrepresentation but the history of science shows that fortunately this power does not long endure it can hardly be supposed that a false theory would explain in so satisfactory a manner as does the theory of natural selection the several large classes of facts above specified it has recently been objected that this is an unsafe method of arguing, but it is a method used in judging of the common events of life, and has often been used by the greatest natural philosophers. The undulatory theory of light has thus been arrived at, and the belief in the revolution of the earth on its own axis was until lately supported by hardly any direct evidence. It is no valid objection that science as yet throws no light on the far higher problem of the essence or origin of life. Who can explain what is the essence of the attraction of gravity? No one now objects to following out the results consequent on this unknown element of attraction, notwithstanding that Leibniz formally accused Newton of introducing occult qualities and miracles into philosophy. I see no good reasons why the views given in this volume should shock the religious feelings of any one. It is satisfactory, as showing how transient such impressions are, to remember that the greatest discovery ever made by man, namely the law of the attraction of gravity, was also attacked by Leibniz as subversive of natural and inferentially of revealed 
religion, a celebrated author and divine, has written to me that he has gradually learned to see that it is just as noble a conception of the deity to believe that he created a few original forms capable of self-development into other and needful forms, as to believe that he required a fresh act of creation to supply the voids caused by the action of his laws. Causes of the General Belief in the Immutability of Species why, it may be asked, until recently did nearly all the most eminent living naturalists and geologists disbelieve in the mutability of species. It cannot be asserted that organic beings in a state of nature are subject to no variation. It cannot be proved that the amount of variation in the course of long ages is a limited quantity. No clear distinction has been or can be drawn between species and well-marked varieties it cannot be maintained that species when intercrossed are invariably sterile and varieties invariably fertile or that sterility is a special endowment and sign of creation the belief that species were immutable productions was almost unavoidable as long as the history of the world was thought to be of short duration and now that we have acquired some idea of the lapse of time we are too apt to assume without proof that the geological record is so perfect that it would have afforded us plain evidence of the mutation of species if they had undergone mutation but the chief cause of our natural unwillingness to admit that one species has given birth to other and distinct species is that we are always slow in admitting any great changes of which we do not see the steps the difficulty is the same as that felt by so many geologists when lyell first insisted that long lines of inland cliffs had been formed and great valleys excavated by the agencies which we still see at work the mind cannot possibly grasp the full meaning of the term of even a million years. It cannot add up and perceive the full effects of many slight variations, accumulated during an almost infinite number of generations. Although I am fully convinced of the truth of the views given in this volume under the form of an abstract, I by no means expect to convince experienced naturalists whose minds are stocked with a multitude of facts all viewed during a long course of years from a point of view directly opposite to mine. It is so easy to hide our ignorance under such expressions as the plan of creation, unity of design, etc., and to think that we give an explanation when we only restate a fact. Any one whose disposition leads him to attach more weight to unexplained difficulties than to the explanation of a certain number of facts will certainly reject the theory. A few naturalists, endowed with much flexibility of mind, and who have already begun to doubt the immutability of species, may be influenced by this volume but i look with confidence to the future to young and rising naturalists who will be able to view both sides of the question with impartiality whoever is led to believe that species are mutable will do good service by conscientiously expressing his conviction for thus only can the load of prejudice by which this subject is overwhelmed be removed several eminent naturalists have of late publish their belief that a multitude of reputed species in each genus are not real species, but that other species are real, that is, have been independently created. This seems to me a strange conclusion to arrive at. They admit that a multitude of forms, which till lately they themselves thought were special creations, and which are still thus looked at by the majority of naturalists, and which consequently have all the external characteristic features of true species. They admit that these have been produced by variation, but they refuse to extend the same view to other and slightly different forms. Nevertheless, they do not pretend that they can define, or even conjecture, which are the created forms of life, and which are those produced by secondary laws. They admit variation as a vera causa in one case. They arbitrarily reject it in another, 
without assigning any distinction in the two cases. The day will come when this will be given as a curious illustration of the blindness of preconceived opinion. These authors seem no more startled at a miraculous act of creation than at an ordinary birth. But do they really believe that at innumerable periods in the earth's history certain elemental atoms have been commanded suddenly to flash into living tissues? Do they believe that at each supposed act of creation one individual or many were produced? Were all the infinitely numerous kinds of animals and plants created as eggs or seed, or as full-grown? And, in the case of mammals, were they created bearing the false marks of nourishment from the mother's womb? Undoubtedly some of these same questions cannot be answered by those who believe in the appearance or creation of only a few forms of life, or of some one form alone. It has been maintained by several authors that it is as easy to believe in the creation of a million beings as of one, but Maupertuis's philosophical axiom of least action leads the mind more willingly to admit the smaller number and certainly we ought not to believe that innumerable beings within each great class have been created with plain but deceptive marks of descent from a single parent as a record of a former state of things I have retained in the foregoing paragraphs, and elsewhere, several sentences which imply that naturalists believe in the separate creation of each species, and I have been much censured for having thus expressed myself, but undoubtedly this was the general belief when the first edition of the present work appeared. I formerly spoke to very many naturalists on the subject of evolution, and never once met with any sympathetic agreement. It is probable that some did then believe in evolution, but they were either silent or expressed themselves so ambiguously that it was not easy to understand their meaning. Now things are wholly changed, and almost every naturalist admits the great principle of evolution. There are, however, some who still think that species have suddenly given birth, through quite unexplained means, to new and totally different forms. But as I have attempted to show, weighty evidence can be opposed to the admission of great and abrupt modifications. Under a scientific point of view, and as leading to further investigation, but little advantage is gained by believing that new forms are suddenly developed in an inexplicable manner from old and widely different forms, over the old belief in the creation of species from the dust of the earth. How far the theory of natural selection may be extended? It may be asked how far I extend the doctrine of the modification of species. The question is difficult to answer, because the more distinct the forms are which we consider, by so much the arguments in favor of community of descent, become fewer in number and less in force but some arguments of the greatest weight extend very far all the members of whole classes are connected together by a chain of affinities and all can be classed on the same principle in groups subordinate to groups fossil remains sometimes tend to fill up very wide intervals between existing orders organs in a rudimentary condition plainly show that an early progenitor had the organ in a fully developed condition, and this in some cases implies an enormous amount of modification in the descendants. Throughout whole classes various structures are formed on the same pattern, and at a very early age the embryos closely resemble each other. Therefore I cannot doubt that the theory of descent with modification embraces all the members of the same great class or kingdom. I believe that animals are descended from at most only four or five progenitors, and plants from an equal or lesser number. Analogy would lead me one step further, namely, to the belief that all animals and plants are descended from some one prototype, but analogy may be a deceitful guide. Nevertheless, all living things have much in common. In their chemical composition, their cellular structure, their laws of growth, and their liability to injurious influences. We see this even in so trifling a fact as that the same poison 
often similarly affects plants and animals, or that the poison secreted by the gall fly produces monstrous growths on the wild rose or oak tree. With all organic beings, excepting perhaps some of the very lowest, sexual reproduction seems to be essentially similar. With all, as far as is at present known, the germinal vesicle is the same, so that all organisms start from a common origin. If we look even to the two main divisions, namely to the animal and vegetable kingdoms, certain low forms are so far intermediate in character that naturalists have disputed to which kingdom they should be referred. As Professor Asa Gray has remarked, the spores and other reproductive bodies of many of the lower algae may claim to have first a characteristically animal and then an unequivocally vegetable existence. Therefore, on the principle of natural selection with divergence of character, it does not seem incredible that, from some such low and intermediate form, both animals and plants may have been developed. And if we admit this, we must likewise admit that all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth may be descended from some one primordial form. But this inference is chiefly grounded on analogy, and it is immaterial whether or not it be accepted. No doubt it is possible, as Mr. G. H. Lewes has urged, that at the first commencement of life many different forms were evolved. But if so, we may conclude that only a very few have left modified descendants. For, as I have recently remarked in regard to the members of each great kingdom, such as the vertebrata, articulata, etc., we have distinct evidence in their embryological, homologous, and rudimentary structures, that within each kingdom all the members are descended from a single progenitor. EFFECTS OF ITS ADOPTION ON THE STUDY OF NATURAL HISTORY when the views advanced by me in this volume, and by Mr. Wallace, or when analogous views on the origin of species are generally admitted, we can dimly foresee that there will be a considerable revolution in natural history. Systematists will be able to pursue their labors as at present, but they will not be incessantly haunted by the shadowy doubt whether this or that form be a true species. This, I feel sure, and I speak after experience, will be no slight relief. The endless disputes whether or not some fifty species of British brambles are good species will cease. Systematists will have only to decide, not that this will be easy, whether any form be sufficiently constant and distinct from other forms, to be capable of definition, and if definable, whether the differences be sufficiently important to deserve a specific name. This latter point will become a far more essential consideration than it is at present, for differences, however slight, between any two forms, if not blended by intermediate gradations, are looked at by most naturalists as sufficient to raise both forms to the rank of species. Hereafter we shall be compelled to acknowledge that the only distinction between species and well-marked varieties is that the latter are known, or believed to be connected at the present day by intermediate gradations, whereas species were formerly thus connected. Hence, without rejecting the consideration of the present existence of intermediate gradations between any two forms, we shall be led to weigh more carefully and to value higher the actual amount of difference between them. It is quite possible that forms now generally acknowledged to be merely varieties may hereafter be thought worthy of specific names. And in this case, scientific and common language will come into accordance. In short, we shall have to treat species in the same manner as those naturalists treat genera who admit that genera are merely artificial combinations made for convenience. This may not be a cheering prospect, but we shall at least be freed from the vain search for the undiscovered and undiscoverable essence of the term species. The other and more general departments of natural history will rise greatly in interest. The terms used by naturalists 
of affinity, relationship, community of type, paternity, morphology, adaptive characters, rudimentary and aborted organs, etc., will cease to be metaphorical and will have a plain signification. When we no longer look at an organic being as a savage looks at a ship, as something wholly beyond his comprehension, when we regard every production of nature as one which has had a long history, when we contemplate every complex structure and instinct as a summing up of many contrivances, each useful to the possessor, in the same way as any great mechanical invention is the summing up of the labor, the experience, the reason, and even the blunders of numerous workmen. When we thus view each organic being, how far more interesting, I speak from experience, does the study of natural history become? Concluding Remarks A grand and almost untrodden field of inquiry will be opened on the causes and laws of variation, on correlation, on the effects of use and disuse, on the direct action of external conditions, and so forth. The study of domestic productions will rise immensely in value. A new variety raised by man will be a far more important and interesting subject for study than one more species added to the infinitude of already recorded species. Our classifications will come to be as far as they can be so made, genealogies, and will then truly give what may be called the plan of creation. The rules for classifying will no doubt become simpler when we have a definite object in view. We possess no pedigree or armorial bearings, and we have to discover and trace the many diverging lines of descent in our natural genealogies by characters of any kind which have long been inherited. Rudimentary organs will speak infallibly with respect to the nature of long-lost structures. Species and groups of species, which are called aberrant, and which may fancifully be called living fossils, will aid us in forming a picture of the ancient forms of life. Embryology will often reveal to us the structure, in some degree obscured, of the prototypes of each great class. When we can feel assured that all the individuals of the same species and all the closely allied species of most genera have, within a not very remote period, descended from one parent and have migrated from some one birthplace, and when we better know the many means of migration, then, by the light which geology now throws and will continue to throw, on former changes of climate and of the level of the land, we shall surely be enabled to trace in an admirable manner the former migrations of the inhabitants of the whole world. Even at present, by comparing the differences between the inhabitants of the sea on the opposite sides of a continent and the nature of the various inhabitants of that continent, in relation to their apparent means of immigration, some light can be thrown on ancient geography. The noble science of geology loses glory from the extreme imperfection of the record. The crust of the earth, with its embedded remains, must not be looked at as a well-filled museum, but as a poor collection made at hazard and at rare intervals. The accumulation of each great fossiliferous formation will be recognized as having depended on an unusual occurrence of favorable circumstances, and the blank intervals between the successive stages as having been of vast duration. But we shall be able to gauge with some security the duration of these intervals by a comparison of the preceding and succeeding organic forms. We must be cautious in attempting to correlate as strictly contemporaneous two formations which do not include many identical species by the general succession of the forms of life. As species are produced and exterminated by slowly acting and still existing causes, and not by miraculous acts of creation, and as the most important of all causes of organic change is one which is almost independent of altered and perhaps suddenly altered physical conditions, 
namely the mutual relation of organism to organism, the improvement of one organism entailing the improvement or the extermination of others, it follows that the amount of organic change in the fossils of consecutive formations probably serves as a fair measure of the relative, though not actual, lapse of time. A number of species, however, keeping in a body might remain for a long period unchanged, whilst within the same period several of these species, by migrating into new countries and coming into competition with foreign associates, might become modified, so that we must not overrate the accuracy of organic change as a measure of time. In the future I see open fields for far more important researches. Psychology will be securely based on the foundation already well laid by Mr. Herbert Spencer, that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Much light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Authors of the highest eminence seem to be fully satisfied with the view that each species has been independently created. To my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the Creator that the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes, like those determining the birth and death of the individual. When I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Cambrian system was deposited, they seem to me to become ennobled. Judging from the past, we may safely infer that not one living species will transmit its unaltered likeness to a distinct futurity. And of the species now living, very few will transmit progeny of any kind to a far distant futurity, for the manner in which all organic beings are grouped shows that the greater number of species in each genus and all the species and many genera have left no descendants but have become utterly extinct. We can so far take a prophetic glance into futurity as to foretell that it will be the common and widely spread species belonging to the larger and dominant groups within each class which will ultimately prevail and procreate new and dominant species. As all the living forms of life are the lineal descendants of those which lived long before the Cambrian epoch, we may feel certain that the ordinary succession by generation has never once been broken, and that no cataclysm has desolated the whole world. Hence, we may look with some confidence to a secure future of great length. And as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. These laws, taken in the largest sense, being growth with reproduction, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction, variability from the indirect, and direct action of the conditions of life, and from use and disuse. A ratio of increase so high as to lead to a struggle for life, and as a consequence to natural selection, entailing divergence of character, and the extinction of less improved forms. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely, the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the Creator, 
into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone circling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. End of chapter 15 Recapitulation and Conclusion Recorded by Nicole Doolin On the web at NicoleDoolin.com